Thursday, June the 2nd. This is your Multnomah County Board of Commissioners. And this is our board meeting. Today's meeting is a hybrid board meeting, which means that some presenters and guests will appear in person and some will appear virtually. If you are presenting virtually, please mute your mic when you're not speaking. And when you present, make sure that your mic is unmuted and your camera is on. May I have a motion on the consent calendar? So moved. Second. Commissioner Jayapal moves. Commissioner Segment seconds. Approval of the consent calendar. Marina. Commissioner Myron. Aye. Commissioner Jayapal. Aye. Commissioner Vega Peterson. Oh, yes. Uh, Commissioner Stegman. Aye. Chair Kofori. Aye. The consent calendar is approved. <laughs> <laughs> Opportunity for public comment on non-agenda matters. This is the time for the board to hear public testimony, not for board deliberation. Madam Chair, we had two people sign up in person, um, injured and pissed off, and lightning super karma. Welcome back. It's good to see you. Yes, uh, I've signed up for City Hall with the subject mayhem and cruel and unusual punishment of 11-15-2010 at OHSU and I had surgery upon my left hip and they did that even though they knew that I'd been transported by ambulance with the neck brace on because I couldn't move and, and uh, I had two spinal cord fractures to my spinal cord and they were after the hip surgery they go through pr quite a process of stretching your legs out to make sure that both legs are the same length and of course I was sedated at the time with the surgery and I woke up in the recovery room and for the next three days they were standing me up and of course I consider that cruel and unusual punishment with spinal cord injury. I mean anybody that that gets fractures in a hos at a hospital where they're standing up with their injuries and all I could do was just throw up for three days. And they finally luckily quit that, but I can't walk. I've got to use a four-wheeler like this to, to even stand up. At least I'm not in a wheelchair. And I wanted to also say that I forgot the words malpractice, no justice at all. Never had an honest attorney, Deborah Kafori's crooked uncle, and torture... And there's, I don't expect anybody to believe me or things, but there's actually 9,000 people a day, according to the uh, death records of uh, 2020 and 2021, there's been more than 9,000 deaths a day on average. That should shock anybody. And of course, I've lost friends with this COVID situation but it was all caused by medical people. Uh, happy COVID. Ain't that nice. And I'll be leaving this paper with the court clerk here. But is my time up? 12 seconds. What's that? Nine seconds. Nine seconds. Well, uh, I think that it's kind of funny uh, with all those 9,000 people dying every day. They all got medical treatment too. Thanks for coming this morning. Good morning. Uh, good morning, my name is uh, Lightning. I represent Lightning Super Karma. Again, I wanna thank you all for voting in Joe Biden and we're going to go in now into the Biden recession, uh, inflationary food costs, energy costs, rising interest rates, 
the real estate market will begin to level off on the appreciation, so that means we'll have a downturn of the real estate market. That's when the dominoes begin to really fall. One of the market indicators will be, will Elon Musk buy Twitter? If he buys Twitter, things are looking better. If he does not, he's sending a message to the market. It's going to get really ugly. And to Elon Musk, when you talk freedom of speech, let's be a little cautious when Twitter talks back to you and says you need to be silent on what you say about us. That's freedom of speech in the country, Elon Musk, and you have been shut down by the Twitter attorney. So be very careful what you say about them and their company and their business. Even though you're the wealthiest man in the world, you need to have caution there. Now, as far as closing that Burnside shelter, that's a mass eviction during a pandemic. I want a full audit done by the Multnomah County auditors on that complete situation. They're using the term there was gun violence there. What have they done to prevent that? Who's responsible? Who's going to be held liable for the safety of the people in the shelters? And if you use the term safe villages, I would recommend to Multnomah County remove the word safe because I'm watching you very close on every statement you make when someone walks into one of those properties and if they get shot and you don't have adequate security and you may stand by and go, well, we're just funding a nonprofit. It's not really us. No, it is you. It is your money. And we're going to follow the money trail like at City Hall. What was it, a million and a half came up missing, a cyber attack? And they told the public 30 days later, what is it with that new Lamborghini Spider parked out in front of City Hall? Who's driving that right now? It's a beautiful car. Where'd that money go? Does anybody know here? I don't think so. Somebody does. Somebody at City Hall. For them to delay notifying the public that's an absolute cover-up. I'm asking the FBI to step in immediately, and I want some answers where the public's money has gone. This better not happen on the transfer at Multnomah County where you're getting ready to transfer $9,205,000. Could that happen here? It better not. Because if it does, there'll be a lot of people sitting in prison. Thank you. R1, order authorizing public sale of tax foreclosed property and execution of sale documents. Second. Commissioner Vega-Peterson moves. Commissioner Jayapal seconds. Approval of R1. Good morning. Good morning, <clears throat> Chair, Commissioners. My name is Jeff Brown. I am Multnomah County's Deputy direct, uh, Assessor, and I'm also the Director of the Division of Assessment, Recording, and Taxation. Um, I'm joined by my esteemed colleague, who likely needs no introduction, Mr. Michael Sublet. He's the Program <laughs> Coordinator for the Tax Title Program, and I'm here to support Mike and answer questions of the Board, if I may, if I can. And um, with that, we're, we're here to seek uh, the Board's approval for the public sale of tax foreclosed property. With that, I'll hand it off to Mr. Sublet. I think after two years, we, we might need in introductions again. <laughs> September, <laughs> September of last year. It's been a while. Yeah. <laughs> well, I always say if, you, if we recognize people after two years, we all are doing pretty well. Exactly. You know, I think we're just trying our best. And so, it, indeed, it's good to be here. It's been more than two years, Chair, Commissioners. Thank you, Mike Sublet, uh, Tax Title Program. Before you this morning, um, uh, is a resolution placed by the Department of County Management Director for the public sale of eight tax title. These are properties that have been foreclosed for delinquent tax liens properties. Um, this is ordinarily uh, an, an annual cycle, but, but due to the events of the last two years, um, it's been uh, somewhat delayed. I want to talk quickly about the eight properties that are in the portfolio. First, I want to stress that none of them are occupied. They are all um, vacant properties. Three have improvements, um, residential improvements of varying states of, of um, repair. 
Uh, four of them are lots um, of varying states of development, developability, and there's one parking space. Under uh, Oregon statute, if a property's on the tax rolls at more than $15,000 or more, it has to go to the public sale. So on some of these smaller properties, the board may recall private sales going through on strips and smaller places. But just as, again, it's been more than two years, just as a sort of a catch up, that that's the break point at which it must go to the, pub, the public sale. Um, the board may also recall that over the last several weeks, a number of repurchase resolutions have come before uh, the board and that you've approved. These are former owners of record who have um, repurchased the property under the statutory and the Multnomah County Code uh, requirements for repayment for repurchase. So uh, especially over the last two years, but always, the program's been especially accommodating um, and adaptive for former owners of record to repurchase their property. So for example, the last two that have been before the board in the last month, uh, both of which retained housing, uh, retained uh, family assets. And so there's very, very few properties on this list uh, because of our efforts over the last two years to, to, to work as much as possible through repurchases. Um, if the board approves the resolution this morning, we will work with the Multnomah County Sheriff's Office, MCSO, to set a date and time for the sale. Um, under statute, it will be well advertised, uh, four ads in the paper, but of course we do much greater outreach to, to get interest in it. Um, and with the successful sale of the properties, they'll be back on the tax roll. In many cases, they'll be providing a potentially housing where there had been none for, in some cases, up to 20 years of vacancy. Um, so again, it's, a, it's a, a, usually something we try to do on an annual basis, but uh, we haven't been before you for two years. So uh, we look forward to it and we're delighted to answer any questions. Um, do you wanna talk a little bit about where the funds go once the sale occurs? You mean my last bullet point that I skipped yeah. over? <laughs> <laughs> the the 100% um, of the net proceeds of the sale of these properties, so the tax title program is self-supporting, but 100% of the net proceeds of the sale of these properties goes to a dedicated fund for affordable housing for families with children and youth. And since the change in the state law in 2016, net of all of our expenses, net of all the repurchases that we've been able to accomplish and housing that's been retained. And I, I would like to say that the number one goal of the program is foreclosure avoidance. That, that, that is a pivot that we've done in the last five years especially, that that is the number one goal. So forgive me for forgetting that in as well. So that's on the front end. And then on the back end, once a property uh, has been uh, to the point that it is before you today, unoccupied um, and ready for sale, the proceeds go to a dedicated fund. And since the law changed January 1st of 2016, over $8 million has been transferred as a consequence for these properties. So it's a, it, we think it has a lot of merit um, all around for preservation of housing. Um, again, both on the front end through repurchases, foreclosure avoidance, and on the back end when it goes to the dedicated fund. Thank you for that, Chair. And thank you. I just, since it has been two years, we'll also remind everyone <clears throat> that our team really goes above and beyond, as we should, because that's who we are. But I just think about back to the way things used to be, and it wasn't always this way. And so you, I know personally, have spent hours and hours and hours connecting with families, connecting with individuals to ensure that um, hopefully they will be able to purchase back their home. I mean, uh, foreclosure avoidance, as you said, is our first goal. But if something does need to happen due to an illness or a mental health issue, we are able to help transfer them into into care and services that they need. So I just, um, you, you, I'm sure you don't get enough congratulations and thank you for all the work you do, Mike, so I wanna say thank you here. And thanks to our government relations team who got that law changed back in several, many, many years ago to ensure that the money is, goes to an extremely important cause. May I say the other 35 counties, they're often um, wondering, you know, couldn't we, <laughs> couldn't we go to the legislature and have the same? Because it really is a, a very effective program.
And you said yes, they could. I th <laughs> well, <laughs> exactly. in fact, Washington yeah. County just missed the break point in the last census, so oh, they, they will, have... they will, presuming population growth, they will also be under the terms of the of the statute. So, thank you, Marina. Do we have public comment on this? Item? Yes, Madam Chair. Um, we have one public comment. Uh, Lightning. Oh, yeah. Excuse ourselves. Yeah. Don't go too far because we might have questions for you, Mike. Thanks. My name is Lightning. I represent Lightning Super Karma. As you know, the landlord stepped up and helped out on the rents through the pandemic, rent moratoriums. They did very good. They did an outstanding job on trying to take care of the people in need during a pandemic. Now we have Multnomah County in front of me here. People are losing their homes. The Biden recession is taking grips on everybody. The pandemic has taken its toll on the communities and the people of the communities and you sit in front of me wanting to foreclose and take somebody's home because of property tax delinquency. Have you heard of the COVID-19 property tax relief funds? Have you heard of that? But you want to sit up here and take their homes during a pandemic, and you are the Multnomah County Health Department. I'm speechless, and I'm sure you're happy about that, if I truly was. But let me say this to you all. You're taking their homes during a pandemic. We're still in a pandemic. These people are suffering. These people are losing their homes, their equity, everything that they believe in, owning a home during a pandemic which they had nothing to do with, and you want to foreclose on these people. Shame on you, Governor Brown. Shame on you for not stepping in and getting the county in line and making sure that they did not do this. I point the finger at you, Governor Brown. COVID-19 property tax relief, you know what it means. They're doing this in other states. They're taking care of the people during the pandemics. And you're allowing these vultures, these vultures to come in, swoop in during a pandemic and take their homes. I am appalled at Multnomah County Health Department for your conduct, for your misconduct on the people who need your help the most. Put a stop on this. Don't vote for this. Call up Governor Brown. Pass the legislation. Pass it down to the county. Do your resolution and take care of these people. Governor Brown, I am appalled at you for allowing the county to do this. You should have stepped in, taken charge of this, and gotten the county in line. But no, lightning has to come in here and make clear that you understand this is not right. Thank you. Thank you. Not right at all. Let me address real quickly two points here that I think are important. You just say your name again. I, I beg your pardon. I apologize. Mike Sublet, Tax Title Program. Okay. Uh, first of all, um, in the resolution before you, no one is losing their home, full stop. And um, I th I'd hoped I'd gone through the context in which um, the county makes extraordinary, frankly, efforts to make certain that that's the case. Number two, uh, Lightning raises a good point, which is there are funds available, and in fact, not going into all of our you know activities, um, we are working very closely with the state on the Home Assistance Fund. This is the successor for the Oregon Home Stabilization Initiative. This, uh, I, you wouldn't necessarily recall, but this was the program um, that 
provided funds to pay off property taxes on no interest, uh, five-year amortizable forgiveness loans. And that was one of the tools that we had for foreclosure forgiveness for many years. It had expired and uh, the state has been very proactive and the state has now pivoted to a new program called the Housing Assistance Fund, HAF. We already uh, have recruited many applicants that are people, uh, homeowners, property owners of record who are in arrears, who've applied for the funds that would have a similar uh, beneficial program for them, that they would be approved, that they go through a, a, an underwriting process. Their property taxes are paid, so the county, the districts are paid through the property taxes, um, and it amortizes in forgiveness, uh, very similar to the old Ho Oregon Home Stabilization in Initiative. This is the Housing Assistance Fund. We work with Hacienda CDC as the intake um, uh, uh, agency uh, who's, who's designated within Multnomah County. So the, the point's a good one, uh, but it, it, we, we are there, in fact, and, and we're, 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 we were very pleased that those funds were made available fairly quickly through the state uh, relative to other peer states. So I, I do want to make that clear, but that is a good point. Uh, Thanks, thank Mike. you. All right, questions, uh, comments from commissioners? Commissioner Myron. Yes, um, I, I don't have any questions, um, but I really appreciate, Mike, you're your reiterating the extraordinary steps that that your office, um, the county goes through to ensure that um, we are we are meeting the needs of uh, everyone who, who has the potential to suffer from loss um, during these, especially during these trying, um, challenging times. So. Um, really appreciate that. Really appreciate your presentation and clarification. Um, and thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Jayapal. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mike. Um, I too want to pre uh, express my appreciation. I mean, I, I, you clearly go above and beyond. Um, and I appreciate your clarifying once again that in this proposal, nobody is being turned out of their home. So thank you for that. Really appreciate it. I do have a question about, um, I know it's a little hard to hear me at the moment. I'll just keep talking. Um, I have a question about alternative ways of disposing. There are. Can you, thank you, Serena, for escorting him out. Thank you. Commissioners, I as I understood your question. Are there alternative ways of dis Well, so let, let, let me finish oh, for a second. I apologize. You know, we, we have read about, um, oh, you know, real estate investment trusts, institutional investors buying up land, buying up property. So I'm just kind of curious as to who ends up buying these properties and t as to whether um, there's, there's even more that we can do to ensure that they stay in the kind of, you know, sort of help us maybe develop more affordable housing, or is there the possibility of the county itself purchasing at public sale and doing something with these properties, those sorts of things? So um, under, under statute, uh, these properties uh, that are, have been foreclosed and, and all, um, uh, all redemption rights have expired, et cetera. They're deeded to the county. There's a number of different distribution mechanisms. The two main ones that that the board sees are public sales, aka auction, which is before you this morning, and private sales. These are smaller properties, um, strips, et cetera. You also will see on occasion government transfers, uh, and you may see one soon again to the city of Portland, which are uh, transfers from, from one uh, political subdivision to another. And in statute, though we haven't flexed this muscle or used it, there's a number of distribution mechanisms that are, that are statutorily allowed for these properties for um, uh, open space, um, affordable housing, um, et cetera. One of the issues is that uh, for affordable housing development, typically there's a threshold of scale in order to, to, to justify uh, the efforts. I mean, earlier, you know, I'd worked on the, the Martha Washington and uh, when the chair initiated the North Williams property for affordable housing. And there, there's a very large scale that has to be done. And so our pro the properties that are in this portfolio wouldn't necessarily candidly mer don't merit the transaction costs 
that go into a donation for any use other than just sort of a pure sale. Um, and so when the public sale comes, we're agnostic. The sale is agnostic. It's highest and best bid per, per statute. So um, there, are, uh, there are buyers who have experience in working with these sorts of properties, who understand the title issues, the county doesn't issue title insurance, et cetera, those sorts of things. So there are alternative distribution methods, but especially since the change in ORS 275-275 that the chair alluded to, in which 100% of the net proceeds of the sale of these properties goes to affordable housing, it's actually a much more efficient way to continue you know, to, to, to benefit that pool of need. Yeah, I totally agree about the benefit of that. I'm just curious about whether there's even more that can be done. I get one follow-up question then. The minimum bid, is that is that a market value? How's that determined? It's, it's, it's set by the program, and it's not, um, it is, uh, you know, we have probably the largest group of appraisers in the state of Oregon within, within the division. Um, it's my experience with the properties and, and candidly over three decades of real estate experience in Multnomah County. Um, and so it's, it, it is, um, it, 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 you're approving the minimum bids here, incidentally. I do want to be, thank you for pointing that out. That is in, uh, explicit as a part of the resolution. And it is to uh, generate interest at a public sale. It's, uh, you know, theoretically uh, or legally, it could be zero. It could be a no minimum bid. 10,000 people would show up. Right and 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 think, gosh, I can get a house for a dollar. You know, they've seen those late night infomercials, um, and so so it's a there's a bit of an art uh, and science and experience to it. Yeah. It's not a black box. It's just we we work among ourselves, Jeff and Mike Vaughn, myself. We consult uh, again. We have scores of appraisers on staff that we will consult. Uh, in order to, to come up with the minimum bid. Um, you know, the goal is to have a robust, well-advertised public sale that generates for the public use the highest proceeds, um, but then also is not so high that it doesn't leave us with properties to manage, because we do want to get these back on the tax rolls and off of our burden. Appreciate that. I, I, I'd love to follow up a little bit more. I don't want to take more time here, but I'm, you know, I'm also thinking about uh, potential Acquirers, I won't call them purchasers, acquirers like Land Trust, uh, you know, uh, Proud Ground, folks like that. So, we, we, but we can chat more offline. Thank you, Mike. It. I look forward to it. Thank yeah. you, Commissioner. Commissioner Megan Peterson. Thank you, Terry. Thank you so much um, for all of the work that's gone into managing these properties and really um, trying to figure out, like you said, how the number one priority is preventing foreclosures, but then also how we can make the best use of the dollars and the properties, you know, when it does move to that, um, to that point. And I know that for all of these homes, that's years in the making of getting to the point where we're at today. So just appreciate that work. Um, I don't have any questions, so just wanted to share my appreciation. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Chair. No questions. Again, I appreciate Mike and Jeff. You've spoken before, before previously, and so I, I really do see and understand your commitment to really make sure that no one is displaced, uh, and then to use the proceeds uh, in such a meaningful and profound way. So, uh, thank you for your work. Appreciate it. Thank you, Commissioner. Marina, would you please take a roll call vote? Commissioner Myron. Aye. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Vega-Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. Chair Kafori? Aye. The order is adopted. Thank you. R2, budget modification DCJ01922, appropriating 30,000 OYA expunction grant funding. So moved. Second. Commissioner Vega-Peterson moves. Commissioner Stegman seconds. Approval of R2. Morning, Dina. Good morning, can you hear me? Yep. So, uh, good morning, uh, Chair Kafori and Commissioners. For the record, my name is Dina Corso and I am the Juvenile Services Division Director for the Department of Community Justice. 
I am here today um, requesting approval of budget modification DCJ-019-22. This budget modification appropriates $30,000 in grant money from the Oregon Youth Authority, and the funds will be used for uh, expunction of juvenile records and added to program offer 50051A. The 2021 legislature passed Senate Bill 575 regarding automatic expunction of certain juvenile records. This bill allows Oregon counties to invoice the state at a flat rate of $206.15 per qualified expunction, as this is an added requirement for juvenile departments. I would also like to note that $30,000 is a conservative estimate of the amount of revenue that we expect to generate as this new law took effect on January 1st and we are still in the startup phase. We expect revenue to be significantly higher in fiscal year 23. Um, I am happy to answer any questions. Marina, do we re receive any public testimony on this item? No, Madam Chair. All right, questions starting with Commissioner Jayapal. Thank you, Dina. Um, this is terrific, both the fact that the, the, the policy change and the funding. I'm just curious as to whether the $206 covers our cost of processing the expunctions. Yeah, so I was part of a statewide um, group that worked to figure out what a flat rate would look like, and um, $206.15 is where we landed sort of statewide based on what it costs to do the work in 36 different counties it was quite an endeavor to come up with a, a, a estimate of what that rate would be but i feel confident that that's a good number that's great thank you so much commissioner vega peterson Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Dina. Um, Commissioner Jayapal asked my question. So um, I will just say that I am also very um, excited about the new policy and the statewide effort to make sure that we are giving juveniles the best you know, foot forward that they can. So I appreciate all the work going into making this happen. Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Dina. Uh, can you just maybe mention some of the types of things that would be expunged from those records? Sure. So the first, this is sort of uh, step one of expunction reform that the legislature, I think, intends to do. Um, so it's sort of the low hanging fruit. And Senate Bill 7, 575 was focused on youth who reached the age of 18 and have never been adjudicated or had any cases um, moved into the adult system. So if youth reach the age of 18, there's not an open case, no expunctions. They are automatically eligible for expunction. And the law compels juvenile departments to actually initiate the um, expunction process. Prior to the implementation of Senate Bill 575, the youth was required to request or to apply for expunction. This law puts the responsibility on the juvenile departments to make sure that it happens. Very good, thank you, Dina. Commissioner Myron. Thank you, Dina. Um, this is so encouraging and appreciate your efforts on that statewide group and getting to the, the right number. Uh, and uh, this is yeah, nothing, but this is great. Thank you. Marina, will you please take a roll call vote? Commissioner Myron. Aye. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Vega-Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. Chair Kafori? Aye. The budget modification is approved. Thank you, Dina. Thank you. R3, budget modification NOND 00722, increasing appropriation for East County Cities BIT payment by 3.6 million. So moved. Second. Commissioner Stegman? Moves, Commissioner Vega-Peterson seconds, approval of R3. Good morning, Jeff. Uh, good morning, board. Uh, my name is Jeff Renfro from the budget office. I use he, him pronouns. Uh, this is the first of two sort of housekeeping budget modifications this morning. So the first one, um, we have an agreement with the East County Cities to take a portion of our BIT collections and pass it through to them. Uh, our payments that we make to them is governed by an IGA that we've already sort of agreed to. So what we're asking you to do this morning with this budget modification is just increase the appropriation so that we have the legal authority to make the payment that we've already agreed to do. Um, the three and a half million dollars is an adjustment that encompasses both the November forecast adjustment, which was very large, uh, and then the um, 
adjustment we made yesterday, which was large, but less than what we did in November. Um, so three and a half million dollars of additional payments to the East County cities translates to about $2.8 million for Gresham, about uh, $250,000 for Fairview, uh, $450,000 for Troutdale, and about $100,000 for Wood Village. Um, I send them a, an email every month uh, updating them on what's going on with the BIT. Once we have the finalized May numbers, which should happen today or tomorrow, I'll send them another email to make sure they know kind of exactly um, the implications of what we're doing today. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thanks. Marina, did we receive any public testimony on this? No, Madam Chair. All right. Uh, Commissioner uh, Vega-Peterson, questions? Thank you, Jeff. Um, <clears throat> I don't have any questions. I just appreciate the information and glad we're able to partner with the East County Cities on this. Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Jeff. I know that this money uh, is really significant and meaningful to the East County Cities and want to thank the Chair's office for really um, addressing our structural deficit and supporting our East County Cities. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Myron. Uh, exactly what uh, Commissioner Stegman said, uh, and thank you, Jeff. Commissioner Jaipal. Thank you, Jeff. Please take a vote. Commissioner Myron. Aye. Commissioner Jaipal. Aye. Commissioner Vega-Peterson. Aye. Commissioner Stegman. Aye. Chair Kafori. Aye. The budget modifications approved. R4, budget modification NOND 00822, increasing the appropriation for the OHS pass through payments by $326,000. So moved. Second. Commissioner Vega Peterson moves. Commissioner Stegman seconds. Approval of R4. Uh, Jeff Renfro from the Budget Office. I use he, him pronouns. Um, so this is a similar motivation behind this. So the uh, voters of Multnomah County have uh, approved a um, uh, local option levy to pay for the Oregon Historical Society three times now. We have an agreement with the uh, Historical Society to collect property tax on their behalf and then just pass it through to them. Um, we normally do this modification we're doing in February as part of our supplemental budget process. Um, due to COVID related stuff, we just didn't do that this year, so we're doing it later in the process. Um, I do a property tax forecast for the Historical Society every year, and then when the tax roll is certified, I send them an updated version of the forecast. Um, what we're, the actual money that we pass through is based purely on collections, so once again, the budget modification is just allowing you to raise the appropriation to ensure that we have the legal authority to make the payment we've already agreed to do. Um, I've been in contact with their finance director so they understand what we're doing today. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Marina, did we receive any public testimony on this? No, Madam Chair. All right, uh, Commissioner Stegman. No questions. No questions, thank you. Commissioner Myron. Oh, sorry, couldn't hit the button. No questions, thank you. Commissioner Jayapal. No questions, thank you. Commissioner Vega-Peterson. <laughs> Uh, no questions. Thank you, Jeff. Commissioner Myron? She voted already. Oh, she did? Yeah. Uh, Commissioner Jaipal? Aye. Commissioner Vega-Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. Chair Kafori. Aye. Sorry you didn't vote, Commissioner Myron. Go ahead. Oh, you Commissioner Myron? Vote. Are you voting now? Aye. Yeah. So <laughs> Perfect. All right. The budget modification is approved. You're welcome. Carrie Timchuk. All right. R5, budget modification HD 03922, appropriation of 1.5 million of CFAA for Behavioral Health Division. So moved. Second. Commissioner Stegman moves. Commissioner Vega Peterson seconds. Approval of R5. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Julie Dodge, Interim Director of Behavioral Health, um, and I use she, her pronouns. Uh, we are here for uh, BudMod 039 22. I think I missed a lot, couple numbers in there, but this is an uh, allows us to uh, allot one million five hundred and twenty thousand six hundred and seventy dollars to our our budgets. This is new state funding f uh, that goes through our county financial assistance agreement with the Oregon Health Authority. Um, what this covers is multiple um, contract amendments that we have received. Um, 
during fiscal year 22. And so we've kind of brought them all together in one presentation to just get them through. What the, so in the amendment, it refers to different things that we call service elements. Those are what, how the funds are attributed to what pot of money. So the first one is for service element four, which is $526,662. This came to us in two equal payments, and it is uh, funding to support services for the aid and assist services that we provide. Um, it in, it in, intended to cover cost of community restoration, clinical services, rental assistance, wraparound support. Um, this was kind of a one-time, you know, uh, what they considered a down payment um, preparatory to the request for application that we submitted earlier this spring for ongoing expansion of funds, which we reported in our budget presentation. We did receive that award, and we'll be negotiating that contract in the next couple of weeks. Service element eight includes $104,552. That was also delivered to us in two equal payments. It supports the family partner of the crisis, uh, uh, crisis and Acute Transition Services, which is uh, a model of, uh, who is a pilot so providing um, emergency mobile crisis response for youth and families. So this pays for the family partner that continues to provide ongoing support to families following a, a youth having a behavioral health crisis. In service to element 37, we received $90,595, which is one time to help the startup of a new uh, residential t treatment house uh, serving aid and assist clients that is located in Gresham. Um, this was passed through directly through the, the state to um, directly through to the provider, which was new narrative. And then we have $798,861 for service element uh, 61, which is substance use residential treatment funds. Um, this is for two different things. $689,891 represents an increase in the annual allocation from the state per diem rate for residential treatment service residential treatment service providers. Essentially, um, the state had already done adjustment to the fee-for-service rates that people are paid and not adjusted the indigent fund, so this is intended to um, adapt the indigent fund to match the fee-for-service rates, and that will be ongoing. We also received $108,970 in additional funds for pandemic relief, also for substance use residential providers given the many challenges that they have faced in the last couple of years and their loss of revenue. So that would be equally distributed amongst our residential treatment providers. And um, that, I think that should be it. I neglected to include all the program offers. I apologize. Um, but um, it's all in the bud mod. Do we have any questions? Marina, do we have any public testimony in this? No, Madam Chair. All right, uh, questions? Comments starting with you, Commissioner Myron. Thank you, thank you, Julie. Um, this just, uh, I think, continues the the pattern where the health authority seems to do this in potentially the most convoluted way possible, and then you actually um, translate it so brilliantly, and it actually makes sense. Um, so, you know these. I do have I do have a lot of questions, but I can ask you those. They're in the weeds, and um, I uh, just appreciate your coming forward with the presentation. And any any money we can actually get is uh, is great news. So thank you, Commissioner Jayapal. Just to echo that more money is good news. So thank you, Julie. Commissioner Vega Peterson. Uh, thank you so much. And it sounds like these are going to be ongoing funds. Um, only the amount going to the sub the residential treatment. So the aid and assist was a kind of a down payment, and we're getting new funding that will replace, will actually expand our aid and assist services. The um, funding for the um, youth and family crisis response is going to be rolled over into the new mobile crisis funding, and they're assessing what that will look like. It's a model they'll be lifting up called MRSS. So this covers fiscal year 22, but not 23. Um, and the other one-time startup funds are limited too, but the residential funds will continue. Okay, well, that's not as good news as if it was all ongoing, but um, <laughs> there's always a lot to figure out with the system, so I appreciate all the work in putting this money into action. 
Mr. Stegman. Thank you, Chair. No questions. Thank you, Julie. I'll just add what uh, what folks have been saying that it has taken a while, but we're we're glad to see the money coming through, and um, hopefully, this is just the first step as more money gets let out from the state coffers for this very important need. Marina, will you please take a roll call vote? Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Vega-Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. Chair Kafori? Aye. The budget modification is approved. Thanks, Julie. Thank you. R6, budget modification HD 04722, appropriating $110,490. $7 from National HIV Behavioral Surveillance, LPHAPE 1936. So moved. Second. Commissioner Stegman moves. Commissioner Vega Peterson seconds. Approval of R6. I thought I saw Larisha here. No? Okay. I was going to say I did see her a few minutes ago. We'll pause for a moment. There she comes. Good morning. Good morning. My colleagues are not here yet, but I'm up first, so. Okay. Okay. Can yeah, you give no me a moment, please? I could skip to R10 if you need a few moments. Yes, please. Okay. Please. Thanks, because you've got the next four, it looks like. Yeah. Okay. Shall I go ahead and read it? Yeah, please do. Thank okay. you, Marina. We'll Art 10, budget modification HD 05322, authorizing a cash transfer of nine million two hundred five dollars nine million two hundred five one hundred and three million dollars from funds one thousand and one five zero five to the FQHC Enterprise Fund 3003. So moved. Commissioner Stegman moves. Commissioner Vega Peterson seconds. Approval of R10. Thanks, Eric. Good morning, Chair Kafori and Commissioners. Um, this is kind of related to the Health Department. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm requesting your approval for um, on budget modification HD 05322, um, authorizing a cash transfer of $9 million, 205,103. From the general fund and the federal state fund to the newly established enterprise fund for the FQHC for the health department. Um, as you well know, uh, my office has been working with the health department business services on establishing a new enterprise fund for the health department's FQHC. Uh, we've done it in two different phases. First phase was completed back in October, which essentially moved all activity for the health center uh, for revenue and expenditures. Um, to the new fund. The second phase of that project was to essentially move historical balance sheet activity, your assets, your liabilities, any fund balance over to the new fund, which is this actual, this action today is one of the final steps to actually fully implement the enterprise fund. Um, so the reason I'm before you today is that at the close of fiscal year 2021, uh, the health center had about $9.2 million of unspent funds that rolled into beginning working capital. But they're on, they're on the, the funds that were used last year within the general fund and the federal state fund. 8.2 was in uh, the general fund sub funds. 
it's primarily Medicaid uh, funding program income that's restricted to the health center and an additional um, just under a million dollars of grant funds that was in the federal state fund. Um, again, there was a grant funds that were restricted to the health center. And so for us to actually move that ending balance um, to the new uh, fund, we have to do it via cash transfer, which requires uh, the board to approve that action. So that's why um, this budget modification is before you today. Uh, this budget modification does three things. It uh, cash transfers 9.2 million to the new fund. Um, it also uh, establishes um, some appropriation within the general fund and the federal state fund to actually move the money over because it's gonna create an expense on the other side. And then finally, of the 9.2 million, uh, 3.3 um, is budgeted to be used this year and it's being used this year, but 5.9 million, 5 .9 million is not being used. So that's gonna be budgeted an unappropriated balance within the new enterprise fund. So those are the three components of this budget modification. Um, I do want to note that the Community Health Council Board uh, did review this request um, back on um, April 11th, and they serve as the governing board for the 330 primary care grant. Um, and then finally, that this does not change um, the, the program offers for the health center, nor does it change budget priorities for the health center for fiscal year 22. This is primarily just a, a technical accounting change. As soon as you approve this, um, we can do the cash transfer to move those ending balances from last year to the, to the new fund. Um, like I said, this will be one of the final steps to fully implement that enterprise fund. So open up for any questions or comments you may have. Thanks for all your work on this, Eric. Yeah, absolutely. Do we receive any public testimony on this? No, Madam Chair. All right, uh, questions, comments from the board? Uh, Commissioner Jayapal. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Eric. Just want to appreciate uh, how what a lift this has been to get this enterprise fund going, and congratulations on this being one of the last steps. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Vega-Peterson? Yeah, thank you so much for all of the work on this. Um, I'm. My question was really, is this going to be the last thing that we're going to see? Or there, it sounds like there might be a few other small steps for board action coming up later this month. Uh, no, this this in terms of the enterprise fund, this is the last board action that will be required to essentially, essentially be able to run all your reports with an enterprise fund like any other fund. Um, so this is the last step. Okay, yeah. great. Well, congratulations. I know you guys have been working very diligently to make sure that we are getting all of this aligned. So thanks for all that work. Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Eric. Um, so the ending balance you mentioned, I think ultimately was gonna be like 5.9 million. Is that a common amount for there to be an ending balance? I mean, I know you're just transferring it to a different fund, but I just, is that like our, kind of our working capital or is that, it just seems like there's a lot of money. Yeah, I, I think it, 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 uh, it can fluctuate obviously with the health center. Um, if, I, if I look at the last couple of years um, in terms of activity and ending balance, it's, it's right around um, where it usually is. Okay. So, um, but again, that's just looking at the last couple of years uh, moving forward that that can change. But, okay, yeah. great. But these, those are um, funds that are restricted, again, to the health center because they're essentially grant funds or program income that's generated through operations. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you, Eric. Commissioner Myron. Uh, no questions. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. All right, Marina, would you please take a roll call vote? Commissioner Myron. Aye. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Vega-Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. Chair Kafori? Aye. The budget modification? Thank you, board. All right, health department folks, are you ready for R6, R7, R8, and R9? Go back to R6. Um, R6, budget modification HD04722, appropriating $110,487 from the National HIV Behavioral Surveillance, LPHAPE 1936. So moved. Commissioner Jayapal moves. Commissioner Vega Peterson seconds. Approval of R6. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Chair and Commissioners. I'm Larisha Baker, Deputy Public Health Director. Um, and I am here for the budget, mo budget modifications and my first time doing one in front of you, so I'm ready this time. <laughs> so we will start with the first one I have. We have four. The first one is 04722 um, for 
PDES Program Design Evaluation Services, and this adds $110,497 for National HIV Behavioral Surveillance, LPHA PE 1936. And the MB NHBS collects data on behavioral risk factors for HIV. Um, this revenue is one time only, but is expected to be renewed in future awards over the next five years. Um, budget modification funds, temporary staff totaling 0.76 FTE equivalent to um, equivalent working as a research evaluation analyst one at 0.36, a research evaluation analyst two at 0.36, and a manager one at 0.04. Did we get any public testimony on this item? No, Madam Chair. All right, questions, comments from the board? Uh, Commissioner Vega Peterson? No questions, thank you. Commissioner Stegman? Thank you, Chair. No questions, thank you. Commissioner Myron? Thank you, no questions. And Commissioner Jayapal. Thank you, no questions. Thank you. I don't have any questions either, thank you. Good news, always. Um, please take a roll call vote. Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Vega-Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. Chair Kafori. Aye, the budget modification is approved. R7, budget modification HD04822, appropriating $250,000 Fifty-four dollars from PE nineteen thirty-five evaluation of aid and assist population. So moved. Second. Commissioner Stegman moves. Commissioner Jayapal seconds. Approval of R seven. Again, Larisha Baker, Deputy Public Health Director. Perfect. Um, the next one is zero four eight twenty-two. This is another program design evaluation grant, and this one adds two hundred fifty thousand fifty-four. Um, in Oregon Health Authority grant funding from, or excuse me, through the local public health authority for evaluation activities related to Oregon aid and assist population. Um, this funds temporary personnel who will engage in evaluation services for Oregon aid and assist population. And the purpose of this evaluation of Oregon aid and assist population is to establish an overall picture of Oregon's aid and assist population by examining patients pathways to and outcomes after restoration, how Oregon compares to other states, and what might be modified to improve the systems so OHA can meet the needs of this growing population and decrease the strain on its behavioral health system. Marina, did we receive any public testimony? No, Madam Chair. All right. Um, questions, Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Chair. Larisha, how is this different uh, from the previous item that we just looked at? They're both around aid and assist. Well, the, the one prior actually funds, um, st it's staffing, it's funding that. Um, and this one, it also, it funds the staffing also, but we're focusing on a different program or project. So this one is dedicated to the Oregon aid and assist. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner, the prior one of the, was for HIV behavioral surveillance. No, that's okay. There is another one, I think, for aid and assist later, but. Commissioner Myron? No questions, thank you. Commissioner Jayapal? No questions, thank you. No questions. All right, thank you, yes. I'll just add that this is um, really important work that we're gonna be doing with these with these funds and um, allowing us to get a better picture of the people that are in need of restoration. So um, hopefully that this will help with decisions down the road. And with that, take your vote, please. Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Jaipal? Aye. Commissioner Vega-Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. Chair Kafori. Aye, the budget modifications approved. RA budget modification HD 04922 appropriating $69,469 from PPE 0402 community chronic disease prevention. Second. Commissioner Vega Peterson moves. Commissioner Stegman seconds. Approval of R8. Again, Larisha Baker, Deputy Public, Public Health Director, um, 04922. Um, this adds the 69,469 in federal funds through state funding for community chronic disease prevention activities for the FY22 budget period. 
Um, this adds a vacant temporary on-call community health specialist two position to support the Healthy Heart Ambassador Program and support diabetes prevention program coordination. Did we receive any public testimony on this? No, Madam Chair. All right, uh, questions, Commissioner Stegman. No questions, thank you. Commissioner Myron. No, no questions, thank you again, Louisa. Commissioner Jayapal. Thanks, Larisha. No questions. Thank you. Commissioner Vega-Peterson. Thank you. No questions. Please take a roll call vote. Commissioner Marin. Aye. Commissioner Jayapal. Aye. Commissioner Vega-Peterson. Aye. Commissioner Stegman. Aye. Chair Kafori. Aye. The budget modifications approved. R9, budget modification HD05022, appropriating $166,666 from Federal Stop Prevention School Violence. So moved. Second. Commissioner Jayapal moves. Commissioner Stegman seconds. Approval of R9. Larisha Baker, Deputy Public Health Director, um, 050, excuse me, 22, adds 166,666 from the Federal Stop Prevention, Preventing School Violence Grant through Department of Justice Bureau of Justice Assistance. Um, this funding is direct federal funding for the Stop School Violence Project for the FY22 budget period ending June 30th, 22. Um, Multnomah County Health Department's project will, <clears throat> excuse me, take a public health approach to school violence prevention focused on reducing risk factors and promoting pro protective factors with an emphasis on individual and relationship skill building and policy systems and environmental changes in school systems. Funds will be used for temporary personnel to train school, school personnel on the Stop Violence Project. Any, wait, just let me guess, no public comment on this item. All right, perfect. Commissioner Myron, questions, comments? I, no, I just, I love this program. Um, no questions. Thank you. Commissioner Jayapal? I, I would love to learn more about it later, but I have no questions for now. Thank you. Commissioner Vega Peterson? Yeah, I guess I, guess I had the, the only question that I had is um, when we're looking at like the, the types of violence that this is, um, that this program is really um, targeted at, do you have any, can you talk about that? And if it's a longer answer, we could do it. I would defer Offline. that to the program. They would be much better at um, describing that, but it is focusing on those interpersonal relationships and um, violence prevention okay. overall. Great, well, I, I agree with um, Commissioner Jayapal. I'd love to learn more about this program as well. Okay. Thank you. Well, we'd be happy to arrange that for you. Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Chair, no questions. You can include me in that too okay. as well. Why don't we get, we'll uh, talk with the program director and get a memo out to folks about what, um, what the program entails. Okay. Thank you. Did everybody talk? Did everybody ask questions? Mm -hmm. All right, roll call vote. Commissioner Myron. Aye. Commissioner Jayapal. Aye. Commissioner Vega-Peterson. Aye. Commissioner Stegman. Aye. Chair Kafori. Aye, the budget modification is approved. And we're done with our regular board meeting now. Um, well, the agenda items, we have time for non-agenda items. Anybody, <coughs> any comments that they wanna make? Uh, we will start with Commissioner Myron. I do not have any comments at this time. Great, Commissioner Jayapal. Um, just wanna mention, and this seems appropriate coming after the last item, uh, that it is National Gun Violence Awareness Month and um, there are lots of events happening around the county, but one in particular in District 2 on Saturday at Holy Beans Coffee on Northeast Alberta Street from one to four, there's an open house to build awareness and grow the movement to reduce gun violence across Portland. Um, I'll be there, please join me if you can. Thank you, Commissioner Vega-Peterson. Uh, thank you, Chair. I also just wanted to note the tragedy that happened in Uvalde, what we've heard happen in Tulsa, Oklahoma just today, um, and just all of the work that um, we need to do as a, as a country to really address this crisis. And um, I also look forward to participating this weekend in some of the gun violence prevention um, activities that are happening. Thank you. Commissioner Stegman. 
Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, my heart goes out to so many um, who have suffered from gun violence, and I look forward uh, to working with my colleagues uh, to come up with some ways to handle and address so much tragedy that's occurring in our country. Thank you. Thank you. And that concludes today's regular board meeting. And there being no further business, that meeting is adjourned. Um, if you are online, please stay in this WebEx meeting for our next budget work session number 12. And here we are. Budget work session number 12. Good morning. Today's budget work session is a hybrid meeting, which means that some presenters and guests will appear virtually and some will appear in person. If you are presenting virtually, please mute your mic when you're not speaking. And when you present, check to make sure your mic is on and your camera is on as well. Relations here at Multnomah County. I have a PowerPoint that I think Maria is going to show. I assume drive it as well. Um, but we are here to talk about the Government Relations Office. I mean, we are a small, agile team that works a, a lot a lot, across a lot of issues, including many of those that you already talked about uh, this morning. Uh, we'll go to the next slide, Marina. Um, we are excited to announce that um, we are in recruitment for a tribal liaison position currently, as you will remember, um, you approved this position last budget cycle, and at that, we actually did a series of uh, engagements with uh, tribal leaders in the Portland area and statewide to build the position and build the position description. Um, I think we did over 20 meetings throughout the last year to make sure that this position was a representative of what is both needed by the county, but what is needed by our recognized tribes um, and we are really excited and hopefully to have that position filled uh, in the next month or so. Um, uh, we have worked really hard over the last year in identifying and supporting equitable policy and budgeting. Um, many of those include the juvenile expungement bill that you heard about this morning um, and I will say Dina has done a wonderful job becoming a content expert at the legislature on juvenile justice um, and has uh, we have been able to deploy her in many rooms um, to further uh, reforming the juvenile system to be more equitable. Um, we worked on home ownership for BIPOC communities. Um, Vanessa Elkin, who is newer to our team, has been doing some deep dives on fines and fees and how they adversely impact BIPOC populations and people um, in need. And, it, and it's really going to turn into some good long-term work. Um, it's very in the weeds at the moment. Um, and we are going to have to bring along some of our other local jurisdictions in that work uh, to make sure that it is comprehensive, but very excited that we are working on that work. Um, we also um, you know, have continued to expand our East County work um, to make sure that we are including um, East County in our policy conversations. Um, that manifested itself in this last legislative session um, with Taylor Seenbach working with Senator Gorsuch's office on uh, reforming how um, late payments um, on floating homes are dealt with um, and to make sure that floating homes are dealt more like real property um, and homes that are on land. Um, so very excited to move some of that legislation forward. Um, also, um, she's worked on expanding funding and educational opportunities and youth detention. Um, this has been a long slog. Um, we identified two years ago the deficit in education spending in our juvenile facilities. Um, we were able to get some one-time money to bring that up um, to par with what we see in our neighborhood schools um, and even expand a little beyond that. Um, she's continuing to work on developing an actual formula for juvenile detention statewide to make sure that they are all getting the funding they need. Um, but um, I'll talk about it on another slide, but was able to actually also get some of that money used to, um, so that um, kids could transfer their credits earned in juvenile detention back to their home district when they went back to school. Next slide. As I said, we are a very small department, um, very fluid, and everybody's role is constantly in change. Uh, depending on what the need is at the moment. Um, 
you know, uh, Stacey Cowan, who is our newest addition to the team as our senior state policy manager, um, is really pushing all of our state work um, with the legislature and making sure that we are present when needed and pushing for all the right stuff. Uh, Taylor Steenblock, who initially started off um, really as our local government person and focusing on East County, but has done such a great job that we have expanded her duties um, into owning more of uh, more some more state portfolio, including transportation, which she has done an amazing job on. Um, Sherry Campbell, who for a long time worked on grants and now does a ton of federal stuff <laughs> and has done uh, Yeoman's work in tracking all of the ARPA funding that's coming down, the earmarks and all the stuff. So it's, it's an expanding uh, portfolio as well. And then Vanessa, who has really professionalized our research um, wing of our office, where we are now doing deep dives in property taxes, home ownership, um, fines and fees, and a lot of other great stuff. She's also done, um, she's borne the burden of um, the Ballot Measure 110 Oversight Council, um, attending and watching most of their meetings and tracking their funding decisions um, and helping us create a policy platform for next legislative session where we can hopefully improve that process to make sure that that those monies get out quicker um, and into um, much more needed programs. Uh, and then, as I said, we'll be adding a tribal liaison soon. And I would be remiss to not call out our legislative coordinators. So we work across all of the departments and divisions in the county and are lucky enough to have a staff member in each department who works directly with us um, to identify policy changes, to evaluate policy proposals at the state, federal, and local level, um, and to help kind of guide our expertise in a lot of this work. So it would be remiss without doing a call out for them. Uh, next slide. Um, as you can see, most of our budget is people. Um, that's really all we are. Um, we do a little bit of travel. Um, just to make sure we are present for AOC events in different parts of the state, but also in Washington, D.C. Um, we also have a contract with a federal lobbyist, uh, Vicki Graham, who's been extremely helpful lately um, in helping us bring more funds uh, to the county, but we are 82% personnel. Next slide. Successes, um, you know, I, I tried to focus just on this last legislative session, um, but we did have a number of successes. Um, we were able to bring in, um, we were able to work in coalition with a number of other people to uh, identify $100 million for behavioral health housing. Um, and with the big success here was to get this actually directed directly to CMHPs. Um, the housing money for behavioral health in prior sessions um, has been more difficult than we expected uh, to get. So we had this directed directly to us um, to make sure that we could use this money locally. And Multnomah County will receive about 10 million of that 100 million. Um, as I talked about earlier, uh, Senate Bill 1522, um, which allows um, juvenile, juvenile justice departments to use some of their funding to help make sure that kids get the credit um, when they transfer back to their traditional school or their home school. Um, as they exit detention. Um, Senate Bill 1567, which was the CEI hub bill, which I have to say, I was amazed that that passed the session. Um, that was a huge lift. Um, Taylor did a great job working on that and, and making it happen with the Sustainability Office and Senator Dembro. Um, $50 million for Project Turnkey. Um, as you remember, Project Turnkey funded three sites in Multnomah County. Um, one purchased by the county and two by nonprofits. This will expand additional turnkey projects statewide. Um, we have really taken the policy position of any funding to increase bed capacity anywhere in the state is good, um, and we want to be in full support of it. So this is a, a statewide number, but we'll create more beds uh, statewide. Um, $25 million in direct payments to local governments for shelter and other services related to homelessness, um, of which Multnomah County is getting 10 million. And I will say a special shout out to Stacy, who was not on our team at the time, but this $25 million ask came in after session started. She was able to get it on the menu, which was just amazing, um, and get legislators to actually take that ask seriously. Um, 
I think her prior employer wanted more of that money, um, but it ended up in our pocket at the end of the day. I will say, we still haven't received that money yet, um, and we are working with the state to get it, um, but really excited about um, that additional funding, and hopefully it will springboard into a, uh, a more direct ask around homelessness and affordable housing um, uh, money next legislative session. Um, right now, we are working on an ask around additional funds for affordable housing providers. As you may know, many affordable housing providers have not evicted anybody for the last three years and are carrying uh, um, some significant debt um, towards rent arrears. Um, and it's creating cash flow problems, it's creating operational problems. Um, and so we've been working with a coalition to get the state um, to give affordable housing providers some additional revenue so that they can uh, forgive that debt. Um, happy to say they are slated to get uh, $5 million tomorrow from the emergency board. Uh, they had their first hearing yesterday on it and it went very well. So we're very excited about it. Um, and then I would be really remiss to not call out my prop here, um, which is a giant check um, that we received. Um, uh, from the federal delegation um, and their congressionally directed earmark um, for the Behavioral Health Resource Center. Um, we were one of the largest uh, direct awards in the state. I think we were also the only one to be supported by our entire delegation. Um, so we were very excited about that. Um, you know, Sherry did a lot of work on this, a lot of hoops, a lot of hurdles, um, and we could not have done it without all of that work. Put that there. You're keeping that forever, aren't you? Oh, yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Uh, next slide. And I do have to show the picture of it. Um, you know, um, I think that was a great day, and we continue to do uh, visits to the BHRC. Um, so far, we've received $10 million from the state and this $2 million from the feds. Uh, we are working on more money additionally. Next slide. So as we talk about our, our COVID-19 and ARP update, um, you know, I, I think many offices had more change than we did um, during this time. What we had to deal with was um, five special sessions over the last two years. Um, this change in remote committee hearings combined with in-person floor sessions have made lobbying incredibly difficult. Um, our access to legislators um, is purely by text most of the time um, with the occasional Zoom meeting. So it makes it harder to, um, to twist arms and get people to see our viewpoint. Um, I will say that now that we have, um, we are coming out of the pandemic, um, we have moved to a hybrid style where we are in the office um, half of the week, basically. Any day you're here, we're here. Um, but we've also um, re-engaged legislators in our tours. Um, which is very exciting and they love. Um, so we've been taking a number of legislators on tours of the bridges um, to make sure that they see the, the need around Burnside. Um, we recently took uh, Representative Dexter on a, a jail tour um, because the interest in corrections health is high right now in the legislature. So making sure that they can see all the work that is happening there and, and meet the good people that are doing the work. And I will say that was one of the most impressive tours I've been on in a while. Um, the corrections health team did an incredibly good job of explaining how hard their job is in the setting that they're in, um, but yet how much they care about the work they do and, and care about each other. So it was really great. Um, and then we are planning a public health tour in partnership um, with Washington and Clackamas County. And then um, the BHRC, we are constantly running through um, legislators to that and then also to our shelters to show the work that we're doing around housing and homelessness and making sure that legislators understand all the work that is happening there and especially the local funding that is going to those programs and the lack of state funding uh, that is going to that. Next slide. That's it. Ran through that pretty quick. That was a lot of big stuff. I was, I was told I had to be quick. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, Questions and comments for commissioners. Uh, Commissioner Jaybal. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, Justin. I, I don't have any questions. I just want to 
express my appreciation to you and to the whole team. You are an incredible resource um, countywide, and I think to each of us in particular, as well, specifically as well. I think you should make a little pin out of that check and you can just carry it around permanently, <laughs> each of you. Um, so just, yeah, just just a lot of gratitude and appreciation for what you've accomplished and for what I know you're gonna accomplish in the year ahead. Rebecca Peterson. I just really wanna say how grateful I am at, um, and impressed I am by the whole government relations team. And I think you guys do such an excellent job of representing Multnomah County and making sure that um, our priorities are um, and our needs are really you know, advocated for at the federal, state, and local levels. Um, I've really enjoyed working with Taylor on transportation issues over the time. And I, um, and I also appreciate the kind of the cooperative work you do in trying to like get things from Multnomah County that also benefit and work statewide with other counties and other jurisdictions. So it's, it's been great. We've got, I think we've got an amazing team. Mr. Stegman. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Justin, and to your whole team. Uh, I echo uh, the appreciation that my fellow council or commissioners have shared. Um, you know, working on behavioral health, housing, shelter. Well done, Justin. I, I did have a question about the project turnkey. So you mentioned, so do you foresee uh, us getting any more funding for that? Um, I, so there will be a funding opportunity for us to apply for money. Um, I don't know if we'll get money. I will say Project Turnkey has been incredibly popular at the legislature, so I also don't see this being the final round of funding for Project Turnkey. I do, you know, we have also started to advocate more for the operational dollars associated with those facilities because that is one of the, the downfalls, or not downfalls, but one of the things they missed in this last round of funding is a, there's a lot of money, one-time money to build and buy things but there's not the dollars associated to provide the ongoing services with those programs. So to answer your question, I think, yes, there will be opportunity for us to get more project turnkey money. Hopefully there will also be some operational dollars around that for that as well. Yeah, I, I think you bring up a really valid point uh, and I can probably talk to the joint office because I know like the Rockwood CDC, um, so potentially could there be some funding for that project? I don't know, I have to look. I'd have to okay. look. Okay. I don't, I don't know off the top of my head, sorry. All right, great. Thank you so much for the work. I appreciate that you didn't say, I told you so. I do think we told you many times during the process that <laughs> one time only money just wasn't going to cut it for our nonprofit partners. Exactly. Commissioner Myron. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I just echo all of the kudos about you and your team. I mean, they're, you truly are the all stars and we are so fortunate to have you. Um, I, I have one question just about the tribal liaison position. And I know last year, it looks like we funded that position for $165,000. Um, where does that, where does that money go? Since we, it looks like we didn't have the position, um, last year goes back into the general fund all the uh, the departmental underspending goes back into general fund um okay at the and, end of the year and so thank you so what is the timeline um anticipated for hiring of that position so the job is currently posted um we are advertising it in a lot of places um, a lot of non-traditional places it is a very um, specific set of skills and there are not a lot of people out there um, that have them and have the the background to fill the role. So we, my hope is is that we fill this within the next month or two. Um, and I will say, you know, I, I think I said this last year at the budget session. You know, my goal was to take time on this position, um, and I and I made it very. I tried to be as clear as possible last time that we were going to do this very slowly and very purposefully. Um, I have been um, in other positions with a tribal liaison. Who has been set up for failure and has been a very difficult situation so um that's why we did I, I think we've done about 20 engagements with stakeholders and tribes over the last year to make sure that people um you know really felt that the position would be valuable and was set up in a way that they would they would find value in the position um and we took some harsh criticism for some earlier write-ups and job descriptions and you know and honored those voices and honored that criticism um, to make sure that that we titled the position correctly, that um, that there were clear guidelines on on what they would work on first, and and 
prioritize in their work. Um, and so I, we feel very good about it. Um, but yes, it's been a slow slog process. Thank you, thank you. That um, that makes complete sense, um, and I appreciate I appreciate that, Justin. Um, do you have a sense of how this position will intersect with the city's tribal relations program? I know they have a pretty a pretty robust program over there. Yeah, they, they have a they have an incredibly robust program. They have three staff now, um, including a director, um, and and I will say. Um, I've talked to Laura John, the director over there, many times <laughs> during the development of this position. Our hope is to work um, hand in hand with them on on many issues. Um, we will take learnings from them. Um, we have talked about creating a collaborative of learning um, with them and Metro, who also has a similar position um, to make sure that we are all working together. Um, I will say there's going to be some differences based on the fact that they spend a lot of time on land um, and water um, and parks and, mm. and we don't spend as much time on on those issues um, most of the work you know are, are, will center around um, services that are provided in the community through you know our health department or human services um, and so there will be a lot of work there that's why um, there will be a an important facet of the job that I don't think Portland has which is interaction with nonprofits that primarily serve um, urban native population. Um, I don't think the city of Portland spends a lot of time on that. We are going to spend a lot of time on that um, and making sure that we are giving, you know, the, the NARAs of the world, um, you know, direct access into the county and working with them to make sure that we're aligned. That's really, that's, that's great. Um, there sounds like an opportunity for such um, synergy there. And so I really, really look forward to this. Um, to this uh, coming to fruition. So thank you. No other questions. I want to just thank you, Justin, your team for taking a lot of time meeting with a lot of community partners to ensure that this position is as suitable and for the county and the county's needs. And also, um, as you said, making sure that the person who gets this job is set up for success. So I know that you stretched yourself and uh, did a lot of work and and so although we didn't hire anybody last year i think we're going to be in much better position this year when when this person comes on board did everybody talk all right thank you so much um we're going to take a quick uh 3.5 minute break and we will be right back for our next budget presentation which is health department
resume our budget work session number 12. Um, we now have the health department down, folks. I think Dr. Vines. All right, go ahead. Great. So good morning, Madam Chair, Commissioners. I'm Dr. Jennifer Vines. I'm your Multnomah County Health Officer. I'm also the administrative lead for the Health Officer Division, which lives in the Health Department. We are relatively small, uh, so I'm really glad to be sharing our presentation time today with the Public Health Division, where we're actually tightly, tightly linked. So I expect to take about 15 minutes, and then the rest of the time you'll spend hearing from Public Health. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, oh, I think this is, I don't think this is my presentation. I wonder, could we switch to the health officer presentation or do you guys just want to go ahead? Marina, do you see the health officer? Yeah, I know, exactly. There it is. Great. Thank you. We can go ahead to there we are. Perfect. Thank you so much. So um, uh, by now, our budget approach for the health department uh, is probably familiar to you. There's a lot of emphasis on infrastructure and shoring up our most precious resource, which is really our workforce. Uh, what ties the health officer division programs together is that we are 24 uh, seven public safety supports. So our lens is really the entire county. Uh, and so that's emergency medical services or EMS. The medical examiner, the health officer, including a regional health officer component and public health emergency preparedness, which is a very small uh, program in, in the world of emergency management. Uh, I want to take a moment and talk about our equity approach very uh, concretely. This is sort of a two pronged approach that we take to equity in our division. Uh, the first is this countywide response uh, piece, uh, which really needs to keep pace with our population increase and needs. So this is EMS response times. This is medical examiners being able to respond to calls. They don't know who they're serving exactly when that call comes in. So by making sure that that is uniformly high quality uh, and responsive service, then we know that we're serving our community members uh, in an equitable way. Uh, where the health officers are concerned, you're gonna hear a lot about racial and ethnic approaches to health through the public health division program. And just remember that we are the county doctors that support those public health efforts. So when a physician is the right person to be representing the Multnomah County, that's one of us. So we're often uh, your physician amb ambassadors to health systems, to community groups. Uh, we uh, serve as the medical authorizers for things like uh, community vaccine clinics, uh, testing, whether that's for COVID or for sexually transmitted infections. So we are uh, tightly linked to that work, even though we are technically in a separate division. Next slide, please. So this is a very simplified uh, organizational chart of the health officer division. Uh, that health officer box uh, actually includes uh, really our regional health officer services that include uh, a full-time Washington County health officer, your Multnomah County health officer time, and then time for regional alignment across the three counties uh, for health officer services. So that's Multnomah, Washington, and Clackamas. Uh, it's also the home of a, a Bureau, Federal Bureau of Justice grant linking um, adults in custody to medication supported recovery. Uh, and we uh, health officer tends to step in uh, where there's a gap. And in this case, uh, that was a very generous grant uh, linking uh, our behavioral health, corrections health, public health. Uh, and so that lives in, in the health officer uh, world. Uh, you see also uh, emergency medical services. This is largely a contract based uh, program. So we don't talk about it very much. It's also the for, for general fund purposes. 
It's also the home of a wonderful social work program called Tri County 911, where social workers engage with high users of 911 and EMS services uh, to try to uh, get them uh, get their other needs met uh, and get them linked to the right care uh, at the right time in the right place. Uh, you'll hear me talk a lot today about our medical examiner program. These are, this is the death investigation uh, that is a uniquely county based service for the entire county. You see there that it's 14 FTE. That is a total. So those are not all death investigators. Those are several support positions uh, in there. Uh, and then finally, emergency preparedness, which is uh, really public health emergency preparedness. This has come down to really less than one uh, um, uh, person essentially filling this role. And that's from uh, several years of uh, slow decline in funding uh, after the attacks of 9-11 when public health emergency preparedness was at a high. We've just seen a steady decline over the last 20 years or so uh, for that specific piece. Uh, next slide, please. So this is our uh, five-year trend uh, and a couple things to note. You see a, a big drop between uh, FY 2019 and FY 2020. That is an artifact of uh, the uh, federally qualified health center medical directors uh, actually moving out of the health officer program. So that used to be a reporting relationship, but when those physicians uh, uh, transitioned to a different structure, their FTE uh, appeared to drop suddenly. And then you see a sort of a flat steady increase, uh, which we would expect for holding steady with uh, population growth, population aging, um, and complexity of our responses. Uh, and I've included an appendix that actually breaks down this FTE. If you really want to go into the details, that's included uh, at the end of the presentation for reference. Next slide, please. Uh, this is our pie chart. Again, we are mostly people uh, and internal services. Uh, we do have uh, some contracts that support uh, just the, the, the nuts and bolts of several of our services. Next slide, please. Uh, so I'll transition now to talking about our uh, FY23 proposed budget. I'm going to uh, zero in on general fund and in particular uh, on the medical examiner program uh, where we've uh, requested uh, an additional death investigator and vehicle. Next slide, please. So uh, here it is uh, again in graph form. This is reflecting the request for an additional uh, medical death investigator and a new vehicle. Uh, and this has to do with uh, the number of uh, seen calls and responses uh, that I'll, I'm going to share with you, uh, with you some data in a moment. Uh, but the vehicle is uh, to support both the shift work and being able to deploy death investigators as, as shifts come and go, making sure that there's a vehicle for them so they're not losing time to respond to a call, waiting for uh, the vehicle to return. And then, of course, another person. And I'll uh, show you in a moment uh, why we think um, that is a, a reasonable a request given our population growth and where we are with death investigations in general. Next slide, please. So these are uh, to put some concrete numbers to what the trends have been like in uh, death investigation. So you see uh, over the past several years, the actual number of deaths requiring investigation has gone up. That's as expected with a growing and an aging population. You see that the in-person scene responses have also gone up. And then we actually start to look at uh, deaths at home. So I, th there's no question that if a death is a potential suicide, if there's a gun involved, um, if it's an obvious overdose, there, there are th those calls will be responded to in person by medical examiner staff. They are high priority. We look at the deaths at home because these are relatively common and you see that they're increasing. These actually also fall within, potentially fall within medical examiner jurisdiction. And this is where there can actually be some uh, very rich information from having a death investigator in person on the scene, as opposed to just uh, collecting sort of circumstantial uh, in information uh, and potentially not responding in person. And so this is where you've actually seen an erosion uh, in the percent of home deaths uh, that have an in-person response. You see that over the last few years. And that's despite uh, the very generous additions in deputy medical examiner. These are the death investigators uh, you've seen, uh, you see the additions over the years, but you, at the same time, you see that particular indicator erode. So there are no, uh, there are no uh, accepted benchmarks uh, for these responses. I think uh, our request for the additional uh, uh, position and vehicle this year were uh, in, in an effort to at least get back to uh, uh, 2018 levels of percent of uh, uh, responses of, of home deaths with seen response. So that would be a place to start. Next slide, please. 
And I was really moved by um, the introduction introductory presentation you all heard where our community budget advisory council specifically called out the work of our medical death investigators. They uh, they do work in the background. They've been recognized uh, through their work, uh, including through employee pub uh, public health employee recognition, which I really appreciate. Um, and I think, you know, the, the staffing model, there, there is no formal staffing model. There are no formal benchmarks. But when our program has talked to jurisdictions of similar size, uh, they are hearing a minimum staffing model of anywhere from 10 to 13 death investigators. So we remain uh, just below the, what, what would be considered uh, by just common practice, what would be a minimum standard uh, for the number of death investigators for our jurisdiction. I think um, the Community Budget Advisory Council representatives acknowledge the services that medical examiners provide for families um, about how their loved one died. And um, while I hope no one ever needs to interact with the medical examiners, they do that and they do that very well. And then to start to link to the public health presentation you're about to hear, when we talk about leading causes of death, a lot of what we know about those causes of death comes to us from the medical examiners. And they uh, were instrumental in providing the initial pass at uh, the heat dome event last summer and in understanding who died, potentially why they died. And then similarly, the domicile unknown report, which has annually looked at deaths among people living unhoused uh, and has led to policy change. So they really are the eyes and ears and experts on the ground for these investigations. Uh, and they, they contribute a lot to our understanding of population health. Next slide, please. Uh, so here's our summary and impact statements. Uh, next slide. So here it is uh, in black and white. You see the one time only request for the vehicle and you see uh, the additional uh, medical examiner position there. Next slide. I'll touch briefly on our American Rescue Plan uh, funding. So we've uh, been super lucky to have uh, put uh, some of that funding towards a two year position for an additional health officer for Multnomah County, uh, Dr. Teresa Everson, who as soon as she came on board in January, uh, essentially took over COVID-19 vaccines. She represents Multnomah County at various uh, COVID-19 local, regional, state uh, coordination and strategic meetings. She's done community education, responded to media, and she's been, she's been a real asset. Our other ARPA request is a health data exchange. This lives in our uh, emergency medical services world. Uh, it's, we're having a hard time getting it off the ground because hospitals and EMS, are, they're just so strained around workforce. But what this project represents is a way for the EMS services to talk to hospitals, which is huge in terms of both infection control, so understanding where, uh, where healthcare workers may need to take precautions, but also linking EMS responses to actual health outcomes, which sounds really simple, but you have to have systems that talk to each other in order to understand if that EMS response, uh, whether the timing or the intervention itself actually led to someone uh, leaving the hospital. So uh, that uh, we, we, we hope to get off the ground. Again, we're, we have to look to several partners and some complex contracting there. So no funds spent yet, um, but that remains aspirational and I think a really worthy goal. Next slide, please. I think that is it for me. Hey, thank you. Uh, commissioners, questions? Uh, we'll start this time with Commissioner Peggy Peterson. Thank you so much for the presentation and for all the work. And, um, and I appreciate the explanation about the role of the medical examiners and really um, the graph that showed the number of um, deaths that do require investigation in Multnomah County. That's obviously grown. I'm sure part is our population grown, but I know that, you know, the impacts that we're seeing over the last couple of years with both COVID and gun violence and things like that are also contributing to it. So um, that makes great sense to me. And I, and I support also getting the additional vehicle to make sure that we can be responding timely and, and safely to all of the, the needs. So just appreciate the work so much from this office. Um, and the one question that I did have was just around the, the ARPA funds. Um, the health data exchange, we have until what, 2024 to use the ARPA dollars to spend it. Yeah. And and so I just, you know, I know it sometimes it takes a while to get IT and data exchanges, but we're even though it's been harder to, it sounds like, engage with some of the hospital systems and EMS, you know, we're confident in with it by 2024 we can get this up and running. I think so. I have no reason to believe otherwise okay. at this point. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, Dr. 
Uh, appreciate all the work and glad to see that there'll be some more medical examiners and it does seem like we're uh, we need more support there. I don't really have any questions, but just want to thank you and your team, uh, especially in these past two years, how challenging the conditions have been and really appreciate all of your work. Mr. Myron. Yes, thank you so much. Um, this is so, you know, you're your office is just so small and so mighty and so important. And um, I did have a few questions. Uh, my first is uh, about in terms of the medical examiners and um, in particular the the death, in death investigators. Um, I mean, I, I could not be more supportive of adding that initial position. And my question just is, is that sufficient given everything that we have been experiencing and seeing and um, looking at the the challenges we're facing, the increases of deaths of people, particularly living outside, um, and you know, with the heat, all of these these things coming together, um, is that going to be sufficient even to just kind of eke eke by? Um, Obviously, more is always better, but um, this it it seems like a little bit of a band aid when we we need a full on I don't know cast or something. <laughs> Thanks. Thank Weird question. medical analogy. Yeah. So, yeah. So thank you for the question. I think um, you know this. You all as leaders have been very supportive of the medical examiners program, and I I really appreciate that. The world, you know, everyone always thinks the world needs more people like them, right? So it's it's a question of resource. I think this addition gets us to a minimum level of staffing. And then I, I think we have to see, right, the, the world has certainly changed in the last two years. Um, I think we need to uh, uh, continue to be on the lookout for national metrics to help us answer some of these questions about what what is what is a minimum standard or what is a sort of adequate. Um, and then I think we need to continue to look at our own internal data to make sure that we are uh, at least not not losing ground or at least not uh, not losing ground in a way that we think erodes our ability to serve families and on and understand uh, more about the causes of death locally. Yeah, they, no, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, it. It. Definitely need to be at, at a minimum. Um, <laughs> I, I wonder, do you. I, you know, I, I think we've, we've talked about, um, I've asked questions before about say, um, it is, it does tie into leading causes of death. Also, you know, getting closer to real time information about causes of death and also ties into the domicile unknown report. Um, you know, in, in some of those areas, it has felt like there could be an opportunity to, um, be able to do more proactively with additional staffing that might be dedicated to, and, and I don't know if it would be a death investigator, um, if it would be someone else within your division or someone in public, that public health division, I'm still hard to put those together, but the idea of, you know, kind of knowing in real time when these things are closer to real time, when certain things are, are happening, whether it's on the street or wherever it may be happening in homes um, and putting together programs that can sort of take on some of those, uh, I don't know how to describe this obviously perfectly, but say if all so many more people right now we've seen are dying of, of methamphetamine, opioid, um, fentanyl, poly substance overdose, um, that we can put things in place to hopefully like within the next year, try to get a handle on that and stop the, the sort of increase, do something proactively. So would, would additional staffing be able to add some capacity to both go beyond the minimum of 
the the band-aid of the you know the additional examiner and maybe add someone who could take on even a little more of that work and do some proactive work around domicile unknown and leading causes of death and connect connect in that way i think yeah thanks commissioner i think you're getting at what we're aspiring to which, which is a, a few things i heard you say so um like more real-time information about death and overdose i think that's uh we've improved somewhat there but i think that's a potential opportunity to your question of whether more death investigators would shore that up i think um part of trying to both collect data, understand it, and intervene in real time. I don't know that all of those activities depend on a death investigator, because you're, you're going you're gonna to hear in a moment about um, epidemiologists who need to, yeah. you know, need to understand that data, visualize it, and then you need people who are trained to, to act on it in whatever way um, that actually leads to better, to better outcomes. So I think yeah. it's definitely worth pursuing. Um, it's on our radar. I don't know that it's going to happen in the next year. Um, okay. It's definitely uh, something worth more conversation. And again, uh, many, you know, many linkages here between health officer, medical examiner, and public health. Exactly. No, I, I thank you so much and would just love to continue those conversations. Um, and very exciting. Thank you for your presentation. And I did have one other, just the one other question about um, EMS and sort of how are EMS, uh, and Tri-County 911 is like the best ever. Um, they are so amazing. How does our EMS globally kind of connect with BOEC and the work at the city and um, and putting and and say our behavioral health crisis intervention? Like how I've been trying to figure out how that all intersects. And that's probably a longer conversation, but I'd like to um, raise that and hopefully have additional conversation about that. Definitely, I, that's it's a great question. It's a it's a complex system that I that I myself am often learning about. Um, so I'd be happy to to learn with you and convene that uh, with you offline. That would be great. Thank you. No more questions. Commissioner Jayapal. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, Dr. Vines. Um, really, for you know, for the past couple of years of work, and obviously this presentation as well. It's it's been extraordinary. Um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Myron, Commissioner Myron actually <laughs> asked a couple of the questions that I had. So I appreciate it both about additional resources given kind of the exigencies, I guess, of this time, the combination of COVID, violence, drug overdose, you know, whether even on a, on a sort of a one-time or short-term basis, additional resource would be helpful both in terms of the immediate response and in terms of guiding policy and strategy development. But I understood your answer. I appreciated it. I think you're saying not right now, you know, um, and I think you've heard that we're obviously supportive of that. So, um, and then I too, I, I too would love a further conversation or a briefing or some way to understand the way that EMS, 911, BOAC, all of those things work together. So um, we'll, we'll follow up on that offline. And then the, the one additional question I had, could you just talk a little bit more about the relationship between the health officer role? And you know, you mentioned earlier that the, there was a medical director piece that related to ICS that got pulled out. So what's the relationship of those two positions, particularly as related to COVID response? Mm -hmm. I would say um, we, we are fellow employees, we are colleagues. Um, in some ways, the Multnomah County Federally Qualified Health System is a is a partner for us in things like, for example, linking people to antiviral medicines uh, on, a, on, a, on a quick quick turnaround in a, in a culturally specific and responsive way. Um, I often use them as a sounding board for broader communications to say, does, you know, does this make sense to you? What's missing? And I think internally, they're always at the table for our COVID response uh, and recovery uh, strategic meetings and conversations. But I think part of the move of their medical directors is that they are a separate entity. They are their own, uh, their own system with their own uh, governance um, and different uh, rules that they have to adhere to. So in some ways, they're, uh, they're uh, I would say, a special uh, clinic, clinical partner, but also in some ways uh, uh, um, coordinating cross-county uh, with public health recommendations, employee health recommendations that we know affect them. Um, so I would say it's a, it's we're not as tightly linked as we are with the public health division, for example, but that that relationship uh, and those needs definitely go both ways. Thank you. That, that's helpful. It sounds, you know, it sounds like it's almost like the relationship between 
health officer role, let's say, and a clinical system outside the county. It's just that it's inside, so there's a little bit more. Okay, yeah, all right. Thank you. Thanks, I don't have any questions, so I appreciate that. Who is next? Us. All right. Public health. Welcome good morning back. again, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Um, it's good to be here with you this morning, um, and we're here to present the public health um, proposed budget for FY23. Um, I'm here today along with my colleagues, and they'll introduce themselves, and we're also representing our director, Jessica Guernsey, in her absence. Um, so let's get started with the agenda. So, Lurie, should you just want to state your name again for the oh, record? Sorry. That's okay. Everything but my name, Larisha Baker, um, Deputy Public Health Director. Um, so for our agenda today, we're, we're going to share an overview of our budget approach and equity and our division budget. Um, we'll talk about our service trends, new and one time only funding and backfilled general fund reallocations, our state and federal impacts and other policy issues, COVID-19 and American Rescue Plan programs and FY22 and 23. 23 budget updates, and then we'll end with questions. Next slide. So today's public health division, who are we? As a public health division, we promote and protect health and prevent disease for the residents and diverse communities in Multnomah County. I want to acknowledge and thank all of our staff for their amazing and hard work that they do each and every day. For our service areas, we have communicable disease services, prevents, which prevents the spread of communicable disease through outreach, education, and direct health services. Environmental health services programs analyze the envir environmental and social conditions that come together to impact health, inspect facilities, and address disease vectors that negatively impact health. Our parent-child and family health programs promote family bonding and parent-child attachment improved pregnancy and birth outcomes in the adoption of healthy behaviors during and during pregnancy and early life. Community, community epidemiology and program design evaluation services works to contain the spread of disease through case investigation, identifying close contacts, quarantining, analytics and data interpretation and evaluation. Prevention and health promotion uses upstream interventions, communications, program initiatives, and policy system and environmental change strategies, public health science and best practices to address the most pressing community health issues. Community partnerships and capacity building brings together community partners, community health workers, and BIPOC organizations and coalitions with the intent to build trust and deepen connections with our, our partners and the community. For today's presentation, we're going to focus on four program areas, large in part because of the significant funding and program changes. Next slide, please. So let's start with our public health priorities, which are racial equity, supporting cultural strengths and community resilience, addressing the leading causes of death, disability, years of life lost, with the focus on chronic disease prevention, the unique governmental public health role before, during, and after a pandemic, policy strategies and programs that improve population health and quality of life. Next slide, please. So as we developed our budget, we used our values as guiding principles in our decision-making, which are health equity and racial justice. We believe all community members should have equitable opportunities to live long, healthy lives regardless of their income, education, racial or ethnic background, immigration status, gender, sexual orientation, and ability. We do not accept unjust health disparities. Community and place-based policy. We understand where we are, where we are born, live, learn, work, play, celebrate, practice spiritually, and age has a profound effect on our health throughout our lives. We have a unique governmental public health role we will prioritize work where we have a unique role that is mandated statutory or is a role that only government public health can do. Community partnership. 
No institution alone can create a healthy community that nurtures individuals, families, and communities. This work will require long-term and intentional action, committed leadership, and a partnership with community-based agencies, community leaders and members, business leaders, healthcare systems, government, civic, and faith and religious institutions. Next slide, please. Our budget approach in applying an equity lens. Even more so, it is critical for us to stay true to our commitments. While developing our budget, we work to keep several priority areas intact, including public health policy, community partnerships, communicable disease investigation and response during our ongoing efforts during the COVID-19 response work, culturally specific investments and programs, prevention and health promotion efforts focusing on leading causes of death at a policy system and environmental level across the life course. These guiding principles are used to inform our community engagement and partnerships. As an example, standing up a community COVID testing and vaccine, vaccination distribution, community partnership and capacity building and reach programs meet, meet with and engage with community stakeholders and partners to identify and inform community needs and responses. Next slide, please. So for our federal or state and federal impacts and policy issues, not only did the county proclaim racism as a public health crisis, but House Bill 4052 was passed in the state, state legislative session, which directs OHA to fund culturally and linguistically specific programs to address health inequities for BIPOC communities. We will need to ensure long-term funding for core public health functions while ARPA and one-time funds have helped, we need to ensure longer term and sustainable funding for our core public health functions. Our community-based partners are key to everyday and emergency public health work. It is imperative that we have equal and consistent funding for our CBOs. The need is also, the need also to ensure long-term support for local, state, and federal change, changes to policy, system, and environments that underpin health outcomes like chronic disease prevention, Environmental determinants and equity work is foundational. The county has taken great steps in these areas, yet we still need to do more in these areas to ensure the health and well being of our community. Next slide, please. So, this is a picture of our um, public health advisory board, uh, McFab. McFab is a community volunteer board that links the public health division with communities it serves. The advisory board focuses on ethics and public health practice and on developing long term approaches to address the leading causes of death and disability in Multnomah County. McFab advises public health leaders on community health issues, recommends public health strategies and policies, represents community and brings community wisdom and lived experience to the public health table advocates for people most affected by health disparities and promote effective ethical and equity focused public health practice. Board members come from a wide variety of backgrounds, communities and work experiences. When we do recruiting, we take a look at our current membership and identify where we may have gaps in representation such as age, geographic area and or race and ethnicity. Next slide, please. So this slide gives us an overview of the public health division's budget by program area. For today's presentation, the four program areas will focus on our prevention and health promotion, community partnerships and capacity building, environmental health and communicable disease. You can see here um, the COVID response has its own light item at 25.9 million, and this will be addressed further in, in the presentation. Next slide, please. So for FY23, public health has a base budget amount of 73.7 million, and this represents an increase of just over 3 million in general funds and an increase of 6.8 million in federal and state program funds. This does not include ARPA um, COVID funding. Next slide, please. 
So this slide shows our staffing trend over the last five years during FY20 and 21 through attrition of regular staff. We were not actively recruiting. Our focus and attention was on hiring for COVID response. Positions hired in FY20 and 21 were um, limited duration positions, non-permanent, non-budgeted positions, and are not shown in this graph. Moving into FY23, we are adding over 43 permanent positions plus the LDA positions converted to regular FTE. This is in, this in part is due to public health modernization funding and incorporating COVID-19 into our regular communicable disease work. Many of our temporary LDA positions have been converted to permanent positions. We have 35 LDA um, positions converted to regular um, status in public health. Next slide, please. So this chart shows how we're spending our funding by cost categories. From the amount of 73.7 million, we have 60% in personnel services, 21.4% in contractual service, just over 5% in materials and supplies, and 13 in internal services. Over the FY22, we have increased our investments in community-based organizations by 7%. Next slide, please. FY22 versus FY23 proposed budget. For new general fund investments, our proposed FY23 budget includes 405,000 for vector control encampment, health hazard abatement, 169,762 for future generations collaborative, and 350,000 for Pacific Islander Coalition. The big driver of increased funding comes from 5.2 million in new state public health modernization funding. This graph does not show, um, does not include the ARPA or health disparities funding. Next slide, please. So the purpose of our public, public health modernization funding is to strengthen our regional data access our public health response and emergency preparedness related to communicable disease and environmental health while centering the needs of the community through a racial equity lens. Our strategy is to accomplish our strategy to accomplish this is to engage partners and the community, build communities capacity for emergency response to communicable disease and environmental threats, increase local epidemiology expertise, improving communities ability to identify and track risk and quality improvement initiatives, partner with healthcare providers, allowing for expanded prevention initiatives, and engage in local and regional strategies for all hazards resiliency planning. Next slide, please. This slide shows um, fiscal year 23 budget net increase of 5.2 million in public health modernization funds. This is just the increase for FY23 and does not and um, is not the total. This funding secures robust core public health infrastructure and adds capacity to racial, excuse me, to address critical emergency health issues, communicable disease, environment, health epidemiology capacity, increase communicable, communicable disease staffing and infrastructure, planning for environmental health and other public health emergencies. Preparedness, um, excuse me, health and fire, health and wildfire, lead exposure and transportation related deaths. And significant, significantly expands culturally specific coordinators, liaisons and communications capacity for public health programming across division based on COVID learnings. Next slide, please. This slide is pretty straightforward. We have an increase of 3.7 million in health disparities funding covering a number of areas in, in public health. Public health CDC COVID-19 health disparities funding supports an array of activities across nine program offers. Key activities include coordinating public health COVID-19 response, testing and vaccination and recovery activities, supporting internal project management, fiscal and administrative infrastructure, implementing communications and health literacy strategies, building community partnership capacities through contracts, technical assistance, and facilitating collaboration, 
emergency preparedness planning for both COVID-19 and future events, such as those related to climate change and developing policy system and environmental change strategies that work to improve health, social and economic disparities with BIPOC and other underserved communities. Collectively, the programs are utilizing data and community input to increase internal and external capacity to address disparities within BIPOC and other underserved communities. Next slide, please. Prevention and health promotion with the intention and purpose to end chronic disease and related racial ethnic health disparities within the black African American African immigrant and refugee community. Over the past year, REACH, racial and ethnic approaches to community health has, has started an African coalition with at least 14 organizations represented across the diaspora. The coalition, through CBO's works, collect, collectively to identify practical ways to collaborate, engage, inform, and take action around COVID response and recovery in Multnomah County. The coalition formed in August of 2021, originally meeting weekly and have since transitioned to bi-weekly meetings with approximately 34 meetings to date. A total of 38 languages have been identified. Collectively, the coalition has held at least 51 COVID vaccination clinics and have vaccinated at least 2,044 people within the African immigrant, immigrant refugee community-based settings. What you can expect to see over the next year, both internal and external capacity building, training calendar covering issues across all prevention and health promotion program areas, building out of the African coalition, which began convening in the fall of 2021 and has since grown into a body that includes the development of a collective work plan that includes short, intermediate, and long-term strategies, rollout of, disease, of diabetes prevention, program pilot into varying communities and cultural spotlights highlighting the numerous African communities within Multnomah County. Next slide, please. Prevention and health promotion has a budget of 8.4 million, 39% um, from general fund, 46% from federal and state funding and 15% in covert response funding. Covert re response funding includes REACH, COVID supplemental and health disparities fundings, um, federal and state funding for tobacco prevention and teen pregnancy prevention, REACH and PREVAIL, and public health modernization funding pays for, pays for the communication position. Next slide, please. Community partnership and capacity building coordinates and implements divisional level culturally specific um, cross-cultural community engagement and partnership strategies to address community and public health priorities. Culturally specific staff engage and build capacity with, with community leaders, community health workers, and organizations. Activities also include implementation of community health improvement plan, the CHIP, and supporting the Future Generations Collaborative, a collective impact partnership between Native and native serving organizations, institutions, systems, governments, and people. CPCB also has been supporting, has, has been supporting COVID-19 response by working with community health workers and community-based organizations, both funded and unfunded. Next slide, please. Community partnership and capacity building budget is um, 4.6 million, 44% in general general fund, 34% in federal and state funding, and 22% and in COVID response. Public health modernization will be used to develop competent, skilled, and diverse workforce to increase public health foundational capabilities to partnering with diverse communities. This program will add six cultural KSA staff to work with diverse partners and other internal, external stakeholders to to collaboratively define and achieve community and public health priorities, such as increasing community preparedness and resilience and climate change. Next slide, please. At this point, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Andrea. Thank you, Larisha. 
Madam morning. Chair, Commissioners, good morning. I'm Andrea Hamburg, Chief Her. I'm the Interim Director of Environmental Health Services. I'm very proud to be here today to represent the 68 full-time staff in environmental health and eight on-call staff who work together to help protect our community from environmental hazards. Uh, together, we work on issues such as foodborne and vector-borne diseases, human-made environmental hazards like air pollution, unsafe transportation systems, and lead-based paint, and climate change hazards like wildfire smoke and extreme heat. We also process birth and death records for the county, supporting Multnomah County families as they welcome newborns and say goodbye to loved ones. Our services reach everyone in the county. Next slide. Um, environmental health services fiscal year um, 23 budget is uh, 11.7 million. The majority of that is general fund dollars and the majority of those general fund dollars are actually fees paid to our inspections and vital records programs for services provided. Uh, the vector for, um, program is funded with a combination of funding sources, including general funds, contracts with cities and other agencies within our jurisdiction, uh, and this year, one-time business tax funds. Healthy Homes and Communities Program is funded via um, general fund, local, state, and federal grants, uh, and IGAs with local and state government agencies. Uh, and this year, additional funding through public health modernization. Uh, and, and thank you, Larisha, for spending so much time on that. And I really just want to highlight that Funding for non-regulatory environmental health has been a long time issue in Multnomah County, in Oregon, and in the country. Uh, for the past several years, there's been almost no grant funding available for issues like vector-borne disease surveillance, climate change, lead poisoning, and the public health impacts of our built environment. Um, so we are really excited that after many, many years of organizing uh, in, in the state, there is dedicated um, funding for non-regulatory environmental health work. Uh, we are taking recent lessons learned uh, when we dedicate those resources. For example, because of the September 2020 wildfire, the spring 21 ice storm, and the 2021 heat dome, we are building capacity in climate and health work. Data from the REACH Transportation Safety Report and this year's Transportation Fatalities Analysis has led us to prioritize capacity building in transportation and health. And following years of community concern about lead and water in schools and homes, we are securely funding uh, capacity and our lead poisoning prevention work. Next slide, please. Um, so Healthy Homes and Communities uh, in our budget environmental health community programs um, works on a really broad range of things. Climate change, air pollution, um, our wood smoke curtailment program, um, healthy fish consumption, uh, the list is, is pretty long, much longer than you would know from, from 5FTE. Um, but I wanna highlight um, service in one area. Um, first, I want to say that in 28 fiscal year 2018, it was a 2.6 FTE program. Um, by fiscal year 21, it was 1.2. Um, and uh, our lead poisoning prevention program works to reduce exposure to, to lead, which is a, a neurological um, toxin that uh, it, we can't remove from our bodies and causes lifelong uh, neurological problems uh, in children and in adults. Um, and we do that by partnering with the Portland Water Bureau on clean drinking water services, um, by providing outreach and education to the medical community and families, and by doing case management for children and pregnant community members. Um, we also, in the past, have had a mobile lead lab um, that went to preschools, community events, and libraries to check kids for elevated blood lead levels. Um, during the pandemic, we reassigned all of our mobile lead lab resources to the pandemic response, right down to boxes of gloves, band-aids, stickers, and sharps boxes. Um, as a result, in fiscal year 21, we did a really small number of case investigations, 
uh, for kids with elevated blood lead levels. And we did those primarily by phone and video calls. Uh, in fiscal year 22, our staff person, Perry Cabot, returned to us. Um, and our uh, investigations this year are on track to be about what they have been in the past, despite uh, having fewer staff available. Um, this year, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention lowered its risk action level. So the level of lead in the blood that would cause us to do case investigations and case management. And as a consequence, we expect our cases to, to double next year and the year uh, following years after that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the vector program works to protect the public from emerging and imminent vector borne diseases by monitoring, collecting and testing mosquitoes, birds and rats, and by enforcing health based nuisance codes. Uh, because we can't count diseases not caught and mosquito bites not scratched, we count sites investigated, complaints responded to and vectors tested for viruses. During the pandemic, three of our 10 member team have been integral members of our COVID logistics team. And many of our outreach strategies, such as community festival, festivals, have been unavailable to us. Despite that, we increased our mosquito specimen testing in 2021. And with a huge investment in social and earned media to get the word out, we increased our outreach in fiscal year 22 as well. Uh, due to funding cuts in the past five years and pandemic safety measures, the number of investigations completed by our rodent team prior to this year, just one person decreased in fiscal year 20 and 21 with strong protocols, uh, COVID protocols and new staff capacity. We're rebuilding our field team and showing increased investigations as a result. Next slide, please. At the height of the pandemic, Multnomah County restaurants and food cart owners and food service employees were greatly economically affected. The pandemic also impacted our ability to perform in-person health inspections. As our pandemic response changes, we are seeing an increase in licensing for restaurants and food carts. We are also seeing an increase of new food cart pods that are bringing new and relocated businesses to Portland. Many food service employees were laid off during the first months of the pandemic, uh, and we saw a reduction in food ha handler card applications as a result. Applications have since increased because indoor dining has returned to the county. Uh, thank you for your time today. Thank you, Andrea. Good morning, Kim Taves. Good morning. Good morning, Chuck Furry. Good morning, commissioners. I'm Kim Taves. I am the communicable disease director, and I'll be talking a little bit about that area, which has a pretty large part of our public health division budget, as well as some of the uh, ARPA funding overall. Uh, so I will mention here HIV prevention services includes HIV care. Uh, and we also have represented in this uh, harm reduction, which started out out of HIV and hepatitis C prevention, but obviously we do a lot of work around um, opiate and methamphetamine overdose as well. So uh, I just want to take a couple minutes on this slide. It describes the services we provide, but I'll take a couple minutes to talk a little bit about some of our equity focuses for the first and the third column there. Um, over the past few years, we greatly improved our regional data access to communicable diseases in general, and that was really useful to our HIV program for the six county area. That data work was funded by public health modernization in great part, um, but it has served along with the culturally specific outreach and culturally specific HIV case management service providers um, to really make a whole system that was able to have quite a bit of success with some of the racial disparities we've seen in successful HIV treatment. A successful HIV treatment not only extends people's quality of life, but it also prevents transmission to other folks. Uh, it's called viral load suppression in the medical uh, terminology. And when we look at the average viral load suppression rates across different cultural communities, uh, for our Asian and Latinx communities, uh, the viral load suppression rates are higher than for non-Hispanic whites currently. And viral load suppression means successful disease treatment, so that's a good thing. 
And we saw increases in viral load suppression rates over the last five years among Black and African American, multiracial, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander clients in care. Uh, and about uh, half of the folks living with HIV uh, get some kind of care through the system of federally funded care. So this is a significant success, especially uh, in terms of some of the limitations in the last few years that, few years that uh, all healthcare provider systems have had in providing care for a number of different chronic diseases. As for the far right column, the case investigation work for most of the reportable diseases other than COVID um, has really learned so much from watching how we stood up our, our COVID response directly for case investigation and outbreak response. And the equity improvements we gained there from the community partnerships that uh, we have built with the, our own internal partners and community partnerships with community partners, as well as just the expansion of staff we have that have culturally specific knowledge and skills that are shared with the rest of the team, as well as our language capacity has greatly increased. So the equity focus there, I think that some parts of our uh, communicable disease team have always had a lot of language diversity, especially our TB program. Uh, but some of the ways that we really systematically built up a community partnership to have bi-directional communication are. <laughs> Serena or somebody from, please go out there and tell them that they need to stop doing that right now. This is not the time for the windows to be boarded up. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. No problem. I was just mentioning the bi-directional communication we have with community. I think our data often shows us who uh, have diseases, but to really understand the why, uh, the community often knows better than us. So that's been a great improvement for us. Uh, next slide is about our budget for our broad area. And this, like I mentioned, is a pretty significant part of the overall public health division budget. Um, between harm reduction, sexual health, uh, other communicable diseases, we just have a huge diversity of uh, federal and state grants, program elements. Some of them are disease specific or surveillance strategy specific. Uh, we also do and have uh, historically had a significant amount of general fund support. Some of those services can't be funded by federal funds as easily like um, harm reduction, and that's been really important to us. I will just mention here um, for the second column there, you'll see that large orange bar and a pretty large dollar amount for it's specifically the federal funding that goes to our HIV care program that's driving some of the size of that. And I'll just mention that because of the size of that, um, we do provide uh, and administer a large set of grant funds uh, to a number of service providers that serve a six county area and we're the administrative body for that. So I just wanted to mention that to you. Next slide shows a little bit about some of our performance metrics. I decided be across the broad variety of services to highlight uh, the number of individuals that our uh, clinic started on HIV PrEP, which is a medication that people who are not living with HIV can take in order to prevent them from acquiring HIV. And I just mentioned that because you'll see that that is an area that we really prioritized in the midst of a lot of disruption to clinical services uh, that we would be able to sustain and grow that. And we did that through telemedicine and a variety of creative efforts uh, as one of our core strategies for HIV prevention. Um, the other uh, area of focus that we really maintained and tried to expand is responding to the syphilis epidemic. Uh, syphilis um, has impacted many different groups, uh, culturally specific groups, uh, sexual orientation specific groups over the years. Uh, and in the last couple of years, we've really seen an increase of syphilis among our folks who are unhoused, especially any of our communities that are using um, methamphetamines or opiates. And so our syphilis work will definitely continue to focus on as a priority in the upcoming next year or two. Uh, that work is really integrated with uh, homeless service providers and with harm reduction folks. Next slide. This gives a little bit of information about race and ethnicity and languages spoken by clients who are seeking our sexual health services or our TB related services through a public health clinic. Uh, our sexual health services uh, not only have a racial disparity focus, but also focus on um, LGBTQ uh, disparities that we see among uh, STDs for uh, sexual orientation minorities and folks with different gender identities. I'll mention our TB programming here. That programming primarily serves immigrant refugee populations, uh, folks who are coming to us from countries where TB is an endemic disease. And uh, most recently, and I do expect this to continue over the next year, 
Uh, not only have we seen an increase in immigrants as the federal immigration policies changed with the federal administration change, but we've been doing a lot of work coordinating with other service providers around folks who are resettling here from Ukraine and from Afghanistan specifically. Those two areas have some distinct TB health needs. Next slide. This is some of the trends that we've seen uh, decrease, but we expect to rise again for our need to investigate uh, diseases other than COVID. These would be diseases transmitted through food, through air, through water, uh, animals. And uh, we saw a substantial decrease in a number of those as people washed hands, as they masked, as they stayed home and just had less contact with each other. But most recently, for example, we've seen an increase in um, norovirus outbreaks, which people commonly refer to as the stomach flu, influenza, pertussis, which is whooping cough, as folks have started to socialize again and take off masks. Uh, we've been doing some planning, especially around measles outbreaks, and we, as well as other folks nationally, won't be surprised to see an increase in measles because of the interruption in the preventive health care to kids over the last few years, which definitely interrupted um, how many kids were able to complete um, their vaccines, not COVID vaccines, but their normal childhood vaccines. So we're really appreciative that the infrastructure that we have in CD across the board has been able to really be more robustly supported through uh, all the different uh, grant funding um, and the county general fund that we weave together. Next slide, please. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of our successes with the COVID specific funding and, and then a couple slides about how we're pivoting that. Uh, we report to you on some of this work uh, very frequently, but we will include it here just because the presentation would be remiss if we didn't cover some of this work. Um, in summary, I'm really proud of the work, the number of outbreaks investigated and phone calls um, don't tell the story of how the other end of each phone call, the other end of each outbreak investigation we did had a, a real live human or family or a scared staff person of a long term care facility that needed a lot of information, emotional support. And I've just been so proud of the way that the team was able to compassionately do that across a variety of different populations and languages. Next slide. This represents uh, some of the racial and ethnic and cultural background, as well as the different preferred languages. If you look at that breakdown, you'll see the uh, incredible diversity of folks that we all collaboratively were able to help support with wraparound services for folks who were needing to quarantine or isolate at home, where they were missing work, they were having challenges with childcare, family support, bringing in income when they were protecting the rest of the community by not going out for a couple weeks. Um, this has been a project over the last couple of years that will continue up through uh, December to be funded of this upcoming year that really involved community based organization partners with their community health workers. It involved heavy uh, work and lift from our partners with uh, Department of County Human Services, Bienestar, uh, the COVID call center that was really staffed by people across all different departments of the county has been integral to that work. And it was able to be very responsive. Uh, next slide. You've all heard a lot about vaccinations, so I'll just briefly acknowledge here. Uh, way back in the beginning, when we had few entities in our healthcare system that had access to the vaccine, uh, health, most healthcare providers didn't have access to it yet, or pharmacies. We had the large mass vaccine sites, and then we had the county uh, able to provide COVID vaccine to communities. Uh, the large mass vax sites at first, you're all familiar, had some pretty significant barriers to being able to serve all the needs of all the community members. And so we stood up a completely new vaccine program with a real BIPOC focus. Uh, through multiple changes of site locations, mobile clinics, uh, the ups and downs, which were overall successful, but definitely challenging in implementing an incentive program and constantly changing vaccine recommendations federally. Uh, it's been messy work, um, but overall, it's been really successful. Next slide is about reach, and Larisha went into some detail here, so I'll, I will just briefly go over. This is uh, one of our culturally specific programs among many. This one serves African immigrant and black communities, and this was specific funding that they had through a federal grant that was really specifically focused on increasing, co in, uh, increasing COVID vaccines specifically in the black community. 
And you can see that not only were the vaccine events uh, where uh, other healthcare system teams did the vaccination or our own team did, but the incredible amount of um, education that was done with the community uh, and the community um, was was very um, appreciative of it. And the even though they were virtual, the educational town halls and forums were really well attended. And I think that was significant that people needed to receive information from people in their own community that they trusted. Next slide briefly, I'll talk about pivoting our work. Um, some of this we have already started in terms of case investigation outbreak teams. I think you've already heard through other briefings how we stopped doing contact tracing, really ramped down the individual case investigation and focused instead on outbreaks in high risk facilities or high important facilities like long term care facilities, schools, um, BIPOC specific businesses and some of our other partners. Uh, we also really shifted our funding to support a robust epidemiology team. We've done robust epidemiology work the whole time, but uh, our few folks that we had doing that work, uh, we're working tremendous amount of hours, so we appreciate the support there. Next slide is about the pivot in wraparound services for quarantine. We do expect to ramp those down um, around December, so you, that's why you see the decrease there in the funding. Um, but like I said, that's been very important for folks to support um, emergency rental assistance, um, food boxes, uh, support to keep their utilities, et cetera. Next slide. These last two slides have a lot of detail in them about how some of the um, decreases that we've had in the American Rescue Plan funding have happened as we've shifted from the COVID uh, case investigation and wraparound service and other support into more of a long-term recovery strategy. Um, I leave them here not to go through line by line, but um, for your awareness just of how, again, we've been braiding together the CDC disparity money, the other ARPA funding, that increase we've had in public health modernization dollars um, to help to rebuild some of the basic infrastructure that I think that our public health folks have sustained over years of decreases and as well to um, really ramp up some of the areas of response to some of the changes in our community that have struggled, that have been impacted by COVID, but we've already had impactful public health footprint previously from violence prevention to harm reduction to the environmental health concerns that you heard more about. That concludes the slides we have, but I do just want to mention that in the appendix of slides that follows this, there's a high level of detail that we place there about uh, general fund FTE changes or out of target offers, as well as more detail about how we're spending the public health modernization disparities and other ARPA dollars. Thank you. That was you guys are very busy and you're all doing a lot. And that was a lot, but I appreciate um, the information that you provided. And again, if commissioners have follow up questions after we're, we have time now for questions, if follow up questions, send them to Christian and we will get them distributed to you all. All right, um, commissioners, questions. How about starting with you this time, Commissioner Stegman? Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you all. A uh, lot of really important uh, in depth work, so appreciate it. I don't really have a lot of questions, just maybe one around uh, vector abatement. And maybe if you could describe, Andrea, uh, I had a meeting with a constituent who was concerned about saying that there was, you know, the $405,000 or the BIT money. Uh, but it was really more about hiring managers, but it wasn't to pay for the actual abatement. If an abatement is being caused um, by uh, other sources, you know, what is the county's role? So she was told that she had to pay for the abatement. So if you could kind of talk about what the program covers, doesn't cover, what it's meant to cover, and is that going to change? Absolutely. Happy to talk about that, Commissioner. Uh, so our uh, our vector control and code enforcement program really works to limit exposure to vector borne disease um, and other environmental hazards through code enforcement. So we don't function primarily as an abatement program um, for vectors. We do uh, mosquito abatement um, as part of our, our mosquito control program. Um, but we don't do vector abatement. The additional funds that were provided were to increase complaint-based investigations 
and also to increase outreach at um, at formal indoor and outdoor shelters to help control rodent populations where folks are uh, are temporarily or long term uh, residing in our shelter system. So it does I, I guess we can have a, a maybe it's more of a policy question um, that if um, encampments are a source of of rats, I'm told that we have a serious issue with rats, especially in Old Town. And uh, it just seems like things have shifted to where uh, maybe we can have a, I can have a conversation with my colleagues, uh, but it does seem like perhaps we should consider paying for abatement. Uh, but I know that that's probably outside of your, your control. Uh, and so uh, didn't really have any other questions. Just really wanna thank you all so much and especially call out the REACH team. I know that they are so active uh, in so many uh, of our neighborhoods, especially in East Multnomah County. Uh, and just again, you know, everything that you all have been through. Um, you know, maybe one final question about the, the contact tracing. Well, it seemed like at the time, you know, that that was, and I know that it was important, but I'm just kind of wondering like, what have we learned? And is that, you know, is that where we should have been? You know, hindsight's always twenty twenty. Uh, but you know, I'm just kind of wondering, you know, what the benefits were looking backwards, and how we could apply that lens going forward for future pandemics. Thanks for that comment uh, and that question. Contact tracing works really well when you have an outbreak that you're trying to contain. And an example of that is that when COVID started, we had sort of a green, yellow, red plan where we thought where we would start with the first case here is that we would be able to directly track it back to travel. Uh, that's how we did the Ebola case investigations, right? When, uh, when it's, it's small scale and it's new and there's not community wide spread yet, contact tracing can be incredibly powerful, um, especially if we have a good few days between when someone gets exposed and when they actually become infectious to other people. That le leaves us enough time in there to find the person who was sick, find out who they were with that they may have exposed, identify those folks, reach them, and ask them to quarantine themselves in case they themselves are, are incubating it and they're gonna get sick and infectious. And in that way we can stop the spread. Once you have more community-wide spread and once you have a certain volume of cases, and if you have a disease that has a very short period of time, um, or it has a period of time where you're infectious, but you don't have any signs or symptoms yet, and so you don't have anything that promotes you to stay home from work or to seek health care, then the contact tracing is less impactful of a public health strategy, and it's more helpful to focus on outbreaks um, in settings where there are people who are uh, highly vulnerable to severe disease, uh, whether through age or co-occurring conditions, or in settings where the, the spread could be very rapid and very fast. Um, so I think we saw that shift, and as you can tell with what I just described uh, in COVID, uh, by the time we had one to two cases in Oregon, already the, one of the very first cases we had wasn't linked to anyone with a known travel. And so we knew that before we even had our first case, we were already having some community spread. So one might say from the very beginning, it was gonna be a little bit less robust than, than we had hoped. Um, I think we were ready to ramp some of that work down a little bit earlier and shift it over to the outbreak work, um, but we are in line with CDC guidance and with Oregon Health Authority uh, guidance as well, so we're not wholly independent in how we make some of those decisions. Uh, sometimes we are, or sometimes we do decide to change, or sometimes we just don't have resources to sustain at the, at the recommended level, and we've shifted resources elsewhere. So I think we would have maybe on our own um, made that shift a little bit earlier, um, but I hope that gives you a little bit of background about differences of communicable diseases and when that's a good strategy to use. Thank you. That's really helpful. You kind of filled some gaps that, uh, as as I look back, uh, to help me better understand. Uh, and hopefully, we can use those lessons. Uh, unfortunately, if we have to in the future. <laughs> Thank you. Don't say, okay, folks. Uh, Commissioner Myron. I didn't say it. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you so much to all of you. Larisha, step, great job. Um, Andrea and Kim, it's always just great to hear from you. Uh, I had um, 
I had a few questions and um, the first one does tie into what uh, Commissioner Stegman raised about vector control and um, I'm just curious with the, you know, there was the, the BIT investment and then the new pro the program offer with the $405,000 to um, vector control. And I'm curious as well um, about, about what the goal is for uh, what, you know, it goes to outcomes, what we can expect to see, what we are trying to purchase for this money. Um, and I, I think when, when the initial BIT investment was made, I, it was, I think it was in relation to so many community members coming out and saying, you know, we're seeing rivers of rats or whatever that uh, horrible description was. Um, and related to um, encampments of people who are houseless and and that uh, it may not have been in the actual offer, but it, it feels like it was implied that the investment was going to be tied to lessening the number of rats. And, um, you know, at that time, it didn't seem like the services were necessarily going to address that in the camp encampments. And, and I'm concerned the same thing is true of this investment that, that it is Im maybe implied, but not stated that it is to address the Ginor the large number of rats that are out there in connection with homeless encampments, um, but this is not going to actually address this problem. And maybe because it is an abatement issue versus a another issue. But if we're if we're vector control, like who would do abatement if abatement is needed? And if we're public health and want to prevent the kinds of diseases we can see from more and more rats, like at what point do we abate? I, I, I'm just curious how this ties into with actually reducing the number of rats um, in that. Uh, that's in a campus. great question, Commissioner. Um, so, so again, our, you know, our primary focus is to reduce exposure to vector borne diseases and, uh, and we do that in, in a few different ways. And I'll talk about what the, the team has been working on with regard to encampments specifically. Um, so we, we focus on integrated pest management strategies, and that's really working to reduce uh, rodent populations, access to food, water, and shelter. Um, Hungry rats don't mate, and uh, and that's what we're looking for, right? We're we're looking to reduce populations through population control measures by reducing environmental conditions friendly to them. Um, so, uh, just as a as an example, um, we did a a tour at a couple of uh, of formal shelters, one indoor and one outdoor, in Old Town um, a few months ago. Uh, we walked around, we, um, we looked at environmental conditions uh, that had been set up to reduce rat populations. For example, um, grills underneath the elevated platforms at the outdoor camp next to uh, our health department building um, and, uh, and gravel that had been placed in parking strips um, near the old bus terminal, which houses an indoor shelter um, currently. Um, we walked around, we, um, our experts, um, primarily Chris Roberts, our subject matter expert for the county on rodent populations and infestations, um, walked around and did an analysis and you know, made some um, recommendations on the spot to things that could change, um, changing food storage, et cetera. Um, one of the services that we offered after the fact was walking folks through their abatement contracts. So both of those sites, have a contract with an abatement contractor and helping them understand what it is that they're paying for um, and making recommendations for how those contracts might better serve um, those specific sites in the future. Uh, so it's not that we don't work with abatement. We certainly work to support abatement, um, but we're also really focused on those environmental conditions that um, either support or detract rodent populations. I guess um, I guess the my 
concern and where I don't feel that this again that this investment potentially is going to address what I see as the biggest concern here is in the unsheltered population that is not in a sanctioned out, you know, whether indoor or outdoor site where say 8,000 people or however many are living outside um, that that's where the rats are like that's and 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 even if we connected with people, I don't think that that they're in a place that rat abatement is going to be high on their le the hierarchy of needs, you know, and so I'm not sure this investment gets to the identified problem um, that I think the community has elevated to us that I feel that we're respond we're trying to respond to, and I feel like if we are going to make the investments that we should be, you know, saying this is not going to reduce the number of rats that are outside in encampments. Like it just, it won't, um, from what I understand anyway, and I'd love to talk more about it. Um, but maybe there is a way that there's something we could do that could. Do we, do we have an estimate of like the number of rats living outside? I know in New York City and places that they do. Um, no, and I, um, I think New York City is a great example of a really different kind of, of rodent control program. Um, mm -hmm. New York City, which is also its health department, um, has a, a rodent control program. They have a chief rat catcher. Um, and, uh, and so they have programs that span garbage control, street cleaning, um, uh, a vector control program much, that operates much like ours, which is education and complaint based. And they have um, rat catchers in the city, so that's a that's a an, a fully integrated system that looks at, at all of the conditions that are contributing to rat populations on the streets of New York City, um, and as a consequence, they have sometimes had great success with reducing rat populations. Um, the city of Chicago likewise has an integrated program like that. Um, that's a a fairly a different circumstance than we operate here in Multnomah County. I guess, I guess my, my, my question is whether, I mean, maybe we should invest in a chief rat catcher or something, but, uh, but is this going to, is this program offer investment going to decrease the numbers of rats outside in the, you know, that are related to unsanctioned, unsheltered camping? Um, that is not one of the program measures that we put forward when we request okay. funding. All right, that that's super that's super helpful, um, and it's it's great to understand that um, that distinction. Uh, the other question I had, there were just a couple of things that came up at the public um, our public budget hearings, and I am a huge just huge supporter of the Future Generations Collaborative. And um, I, I believe it's a brilliant model. And um, I'm I'm trying to put together the, the funding sources, where it had been funded before, if there's new funding that's been added. And then we heard some testimony that that was not going to be sufficient to fund the services that are needed. And I'm I'm curious about if you could speak to that. Thank you for the question. Great question. We did add um, some additional funding, um, but I don't have all the details in front of me right yeah, now. We'll write it down on the list. Okay. Larisha, awesome. don't worry. <laughs> With you. Perfect. That don't would be great. To, uh, try to <laughs> write something down and get back to you. And um, I guess those are those are sort of my my main uh, one one last question how how does the harm reduction work so for example with opioids methamphetamines um, polysubstance use fentanyl all of that stuff how does that tie into the broader work on addressing leading causes of death and tie into the behavioral health department and their work on substance use disorder and the work of the joint office um, with houselessness and these being such huge issues in the unsheltered houseless population. Thanks for that question. Um, 
This is Kim Taves again. I'm the, one of the directors of the harm reduction area. Uh, we have historically done a lot of um, capacity building among uh, substance use service providers, community based organizations, uh, smaller healthcare response systems about uh, training their staff to have a trainer on site internal to each of their organizations to recognize overdose to be able to respond to it, to um, disseminate naloxone for opiate overdoses specifically, um, either on site if they have service providers where they feel like there's a risk of overdose on site or to their own client population. Uh, and part of that, we've always incorporated a full extent of um, overdose prevention messages, right? Uh, naloxone is what you do when somebody else that you find is overdosing. And Dr. Myron, I know you know this, but I'll say to everyone else who's listening, uh, but there are prevention strategies for people about how they can use drugs in ways that are more safe so that they don't begin to overdose in the first place. Um, we've definitely had a significant increase in methamphetamine overdoses, and naloxone does not treat methamphetamine overdose. Uh, the the um, addictions treatment models for methamphetamine are more limited in their toolkit in general compared to, to opiate addiction. Um, so that is a greater challenge as we've seen the drug use shift. Um, a good news in terms of some of the problems that we have with injection, uh, this I put in quotes, in, in our world, this is good news, although in the big picture it is not. Um, more commonly, folks are switching from injecting to smoking drugs right now as they move from heroin to pills, uh, mostly counterfeit pills. Fentanyl is involved um, in that. Um, that puts people at less risk for some of the other complications like um, bloodborne pathogen transmission, abscesses, et cetera, if the way that they're using drugs is not injecting, but it doesn't necessarily change their overdose risk a whole lot. I think uh, in terms of coordinating with behavioral health, uh, there's been a great shift in culture nationally, and this has shown up more recently in the federal grants and how they're written, which sometimes drives how the programmatic work happens to be inclusive of harm reduction activities for the uh, addictions treatment and recovery service providers. Um, Measure 110 also right, has had a um, starting to have impact, uh, although it's been a little bit slow to get started in our state. Um, there's a lot of innovation there in terms of how harm reduction will get incorporated. We wanna make sure that harm reduction uh, in its broadest sense, uh, that is something that gets integrated into counseling approaches, right? So that it's not abstinence only, but people can still access support if they wanna reduce their use, um, but, but they may not be ready to fully quit. Um, to the opiate overdose, uh, naloxone medication, to the clean syringes, uh, there's a whole broad set of harm reduction strategies. So I think that we have more work to do across public health, across our primary care and behavioral health to coordinate around poly substances. That also needs to include alcohol, right? And some of our, our other drugs that really impact some of the chronic disease problems we have, um, liver health, et cetera. Uh, some of the violence is, is impacted by drug and alcohol use. Um, so there's a lot more work to be done. Uh, I think we have a good start at doing that, um, but definitely more improvement to be made. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for that, um, that really, um, comprehensive thoughtful answer um and look forward to doing all of to doing that work that's it that's a, all my questions thank you chair thank you so much everybody um really appreciate this this overview you know i, I don't know that i have additional questions my colleagues have 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 raised some of the, the questions that i had but i'll mention them just so i'm registering interest um the vector control you know and the question of E, the, the question of whether we take on something like what the city of New York does or Chicago does, that, that, that is, that's not something we're going to decide today. But I, I think there is clearly this public interest and desire for something more at this moment in time. So I, I don't, I, you, you've answered the question, Andrea, so I don't really have a question to follow up on that. I'm just registering that it's something that we are certainly hearing. Um, my biggest question was really our COVID response. You know, what's the shift and, and how does that translate into the budget? So I really, I, I don't have a follow-up question. I see you reaching for your laptop, Kim, <laughs> but I want to appreciate the information that you provided and I will, you know, I'll look at that and if I have, I have specific follow-ups, I'll, I'll send them along. And then harm reduction was my, my third category. And um, 
you've addressed it in a in a broad sense in response to, to Commissioner Myron's question. I guess the only follow up I would have, uh, you know, things like safe injection sites. Like so, so the broader question is, what's next on our list? in terms of harm reduction. What I see in the budget is the budget is static. That certainly does not mean that the work is static. I recognize that. But the budget is static at a time when overdoses, drug use, you know, all of that is is going up and is in the crisis stage. So so I guess what 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 do you see as next and um what are shifts or expansions that you're thinking about that are built into this budget? Uh I'll name one shift for us and then i'll i will bookmark for us uh one thing you mentioned and another thing as well that um our desires from community members are seen as best practices elsewhere that we're all going to need to grapple with politically legally etc uh in partnership with uh communities that are impacted by drug use and with some of our other service providers um the one that we're working on in our own smaller harm reduction team uh is that as there's been a cultural shift, and I say this cultural, not like an ethnic culture, but like a, a organizational or political culture where harm reduction is more acceptable and familiar to people than it used to be. It used to be a very radical concept, even though the science really strongly supported it. I feel like we're in a place where we have had a lot of stand up during COVID of organic community mutual aid organizations and people's desires to just reach out and help each other. And one of the places that people have had a desire to help is through providing harm reduction support to folks, especially folks who are living outside, right? Um, who um, are injecting drugs and using drugs through other methods, like I mentioned. They need some some technical assistance and support and training so that it goes from more of what I'd call like your your initial liberal how can I help to something that's really <laughs> you smiled at that <laughs> Dr. Myron, from something that's really um, informed by best practice uh, and um, another area is that we have a number of different community based organizations that serve um, culturally specific communities. Uh, may or may not have a focus on drug or alcohol use specifically, but I think that the, we've made great strides in, in a working with a lot of CBOs who either provide supportive services to families or provide political advocacy, et cetera, but have seen that they do have a role in public health in general. And that may be started with um, relationship and sexual health education, and then it certainly ramped up a lot with COVID. And I think that there's a there's an awareness or capacity or interest a little bit more than there used to be to take on some of that harm reduction work and, and to further that in communities than our small team could have the reach towards. So the area we'll focus is on doing some of that community partnership and community capacitation work more than just the direct service delivery work. Uh, and like I said, we've done a lot of that with the naloxone distribution, but I think that we we can use a stronger uh, equity focus and a little bit broader sense of, of harm reduction approaches. Um, two things we'll all need to grapple with, and one of them we were grappling with for sure before COVID started, but we got some federal blockades from the, the previous federal administration saying that they would aggressively uh, pursue uh, legal um options to shut down any uh, government or community-based organization that tried to stand up safe consumption sites right or safe drug use sites um they used to be known as safe injection sites and uh, certainly they've been used internationally um, with great success at reducing overdose uh they uh, in amsterdam for example they came out of people who were living outside and didn't have an indoor space to inject drugs um, giving people a place where they could do that. And it wasn't, um, it wasn't giving them the encouragement to use drugs, but it was acknowledging that their addiction made them need to, and we could do that in a better and more humane way that would solve a lot of problems for a lot of folks. Uh, I think that there's been a huge clamor for that, and that's something that we'll all need to figure out what's our role as county government to grapple with that. Um, as folks move to um, move away from uh, injecting to smoking drugs, which in general is is a strong helpful harm reduction um, behavior change um, there's been a lot of desire and request for folks to have safe smoking um, implements to do that and that that's been a community engagement strategy as well 
Um, that's something that our own program doesn't fund and doesn't provide, but that's that's certainly a request. So that's just a couple of things I'll bookmark for us to have further conversation about. That's great. I really appreciate that, and that's really helpful. I, you know, I, I, I'm very interested in that conversation. Um, I, I do think some things have shifted culturally, politically, environmentally that could allow us to do some of that work. So um, uh, it's great to hear that that's that we're continuing to think about that and move that forward. Thank you. Commissioner Vega Peterson. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you all, Larisha and Kim and Andrea, for all this um, great information. There's so much work that happens within the umbrella of public health. Um, and um, <clears throat> and I think the, the work has just been incredible. And I, and I really appreciate all the um, conversations that we have had uh, um, on this and, and just the questions that my, my um, colleagues have asked around some of these issues. I mean, I, I also um, am and like they're around vector control specifically you know i appreciate the traditional work that environmental health has done to really educate and help people become um you know wiser and better educated about what they can do to prevent um uh rat infestations and decrease the existing rat populations i really feel though at this point like we just have too many rats right now. Like the population has increased over the past years that we need to be more aggressive in how we're approaching this. And I don't know that this is necessarily something that um, we need to be taking on, but we know that there are like private exterminators and there are people who are, you know, already doing the work of, of rat control. And, you know, it. I, I think that, you know, as a part of the response that we need to the impacts of um, having a large unsheltered population, you know, we also, as a government entity need to be responding to that. And I think we had a good first step with that, with the BIT investments and that work. But I'm, I, you know, I'm very interested in seeing us do more, um, you know, either in this budget period or working with the city and the work, you know, in the, in the role that they're going to have. It was interesting to hear that some of the ways that Chicago and New York, you know, were integrating this work was with with the, the garbage collection and all that. And we know that that is definitely something where there's multi-jurisdictions, you know, engaged in that. So um, so this is something that I, you know, I'm interested in in talking about and looking at further. Um, and I, I appreciate the conversation we're having on harm reduction for sure. Um, you know, I think that, I think that we have been such a great model in the work that we've done here at Multnomah County, and I've been so proud to support that. And I appreciate Commissioner Dryopal's questions about what's, what's the next things that we can be doing um, as well as responding to the crises that we know are in front of us. Um, so I don't have any specific questions around that, um, but also, I mean, and I think just something that I'm very interested in is looking as we go from the, you know, the COVID pandemic to kind of the po the, the long-term, you know, COVID and the role that, how we can continue to be there for the community. And I think that what you described in terms of the wraparound services, the way that we've really um, just to embrace how we can how can we can respond um, to community members holistically is is you know something that we'll want to continue. So, um, thank you guys so much for the presentations. No specific questions, but um, probably more more conversations later. Thank you. Well, that concludes our budget work session number twelve. Uh, we will be back here and we'll take a little bit of a break. Come back Tuesday morning at nine a.m. Just check. 9 a.m. on Tuesday. Yes, it is 9 a.m. on Tuesday, where we will start with the very important county attorney budget. Jenny, you're not even listening. <laughs> That's you. You're up Tuesday morning, 9 a.m. Thank you. We'll see you then. Thanks, team.